Our story begins in one picturesque place, the port of Lit. A huge ship is approaching this port, and the pleasant sound of waves can be heard all around. When the ship arrived at the port, the seagulls that were sitting at the pier took off into the air, and finally those who were on the ship came to land, and some were very happy about it. The young guy joyfully raised his hands up and shouted that they had finally gotten here. He began to look around, he was interested in absolutely everything, and the first thing he noticed was a cute woman in a bunny costume who turned to the man and said that he could buy the potion only after he did her a favor. Also in the port there was immediately a market where fish and other sea creatures were sold. Voices were heard from everywhere in the port. People were busy with their own affairs. Some were looking for a warehouse where they could store their items. Others wanted to train and travel the world with other sailors. Someone was completely lost. A young and surprised guy who had just arrived at this port with sparkling eyes looked around and was happy. A dark-skinned, white-haired man came up to him and hugged this guy with one arm asking if he was glad to be here, and called him by name. This guy's name was Raymond. This white-haired man was named Walker. Raymond turned to him and said that he had to admit that he was also delighted with this place. Other people also arrived here with them. A man in a green jacket and hat said that he wanted to tell everyone in this port how he felt. His name was Theron. Next to him was a cute girl with black hair. Theron wanted to tell everyone how he feels because their adventure begins here. This is the time when adventurers from all over the world write their own stories of epic journeys. It's the age of adventure. The gate is a mysterious portal that suddenly began to appear all over the world. These gates lead to worlds where terrible monsters unknown to anyone live. Countless adventurers have died within the gate, but the rewards certainly outweigh the risks. This forces ambitious people to continue to experience new worlds. A white-haired man with dark skin and blue eyes said that they needed bait. At the same time, he pointed his finger directly at Raymond, who stood in bewilderment. He also said that it is impossible to come up with a strategy before entering the gate, since it is unknown what to expect. Those who risk doing this in many seasons for this very reason took their lives in unforeseen circumstances, and now began to hire bait slaves. The girl who stood by the wall asked, Are we talking about those who will distract the attention of the monsters while they run away from the battlefield? She thought that it seemed to her that this was a good idea, and so they immediately went to where these slaves were. The man who traded them greeted the white-haired man and the other members of the team and said that he was glad to see them here. This place is owned and managed by the Gapor Trading Guild, all who are slaves of bait, and he hopes that they have a suitable product for them. Then the seller laughed loudly and said that they would definitely buy their expenses. He could guarantee that, and if they allowed him, he could recommend two of you. He pointed his hand at the guys he was referring to and said that he had just received them, so they were relatively fresh. Walker said that he would buy two of them. The seller said that the buyer had impeccable and excellent taste. After some time, they went straight to the portal and were wished good luck on their journey. Walker said that the adventurers leave marks on the trunk that show how many teams entered this particular gate, but there is not a single one in front of this gate. Then Walker said what it means they will be first, and drew a symbol there. Then. With a smile and some excitement in his eyes, he looked at his comrades and asked if they were ready. Everyone was also positive, and said that they were ready to move forward. Immediately after that, they crossed the threshold of that portal and found themselves in another space. Raymond immediately entered and felt that there was a very strange feeling here. Looking around, he was very surprised. This world was incredibly interesting. It is located in a real forest of huge mushrooms that also glow. He said that he had never been to such a bizarre place before. Inside, brother, the atmosphere was not at all what he imagined. Walker told the slaves that they need to go forward. Don't panic, the portal usually opens far from the monster's lair, so they are safe for now. But it is impossible to exit along the same path they came in. Their priority is to determine the location in Rad with the exit. Suddenly, the girl who was on this team felt someone's gaze on her. As she looked, she noticed behind her a huge creature that was already sticking its claws into her. A moment later, this creature simply destroyed the poor girl who did not even expect such a quick end to her life. Everyone was alarmed. The slaves asked why there were monsters here. The girl's name was Charlotte, and she had just been eaten by a huge monster. Having looked around, the guys noticed that this monster is not alone here. There are a whole horde of them here. Walker grabbed his bow, which he had once bought from a mage and aimed at the monsters with fiery arrows. He fired one fiery arrow and pierced right through the huge creature that attacked Charlotte. 
Walker understood that something was wrong here, and ordered the bait to be tied to a tree. We need to run away from here. The slaves begged those guys to wait and take them with them. But they did not listen to the slaves. The man in the green hat shouted for the slave to shut his mouth and stand still. Raymond tied the slaves' chains to a tree. He felt very sorry for these guys. As soon as they did this, they immediately began to run away, the slaves begging them not to leave them. But that's exactly why they were taken here, they were bait. The ferocious creatures first attacked those poor fellows who were tied to the tree. Walker grabbed the wounded Charlotte's body and ran away with her carrying her on his back. He shouted that the task was being postponed. Now is not the time to hunt monsters. We need to find a way out, and quickly. Raymond was shocked by everything that was happening here. He did not expect that everything would not be as fun as he thought. He stopped and was breathing heavily. The man in the green hat grabbed him and shouted for the fool to come to his senses. They need to listen to Walker's instructions. They need to calm down. Their adventure was a complete failure this time. But they can prepare better to try again. It's too early to give up. They can't let their guard down. While he was saying that together they would survive, another huge creature appeared behind him, which was very fast. This huge feathered creature very quickly hit the man in the green hat with its huge paw and simply crushed him on the spot. Walker was beside himself with rage and pity. Tears flowed from his eyes because he was very sorry that Theron also died. When you huge creature raised your clawed and huge paw, everyone saw that Theron could no longer be saved. Raymond fell to the ground and froze in horror looking at the dead body of his comrade. Walker again grabbed his staff, which he used as a bow, and aimed at the ferocious creature. Well, this creature was too fast. In an instant this terrible beast stuck out its long tongue. With this tongue, he grabbed Walker's neck and squeezed him hard. Then this huge creature began to drag him straight into its terrible mouth full of sword-sharp teeth. The last thing that man shouted was words for help, but no one saved him. Raymond had never experienced such a shock in his life. All his friends were destroyed before his eyes. The young guy noticed that the creature was approaching him and, in horror, began to crawl in the other direction. He didn't know what to do. The horror numbed him so much that he simply couldn't help himself. The creature grabbed his leg with its sticky and long tongue and its teeth into it. The guy screamed very loudly, but someone was watching him all this time. Suddenly he looked up the mountain and noticed there the same slave whom he had tied to a tree. He was very surprised that the bait survived, and it would seem that this man is now his hope. Raymond shouted that thank God he survived. What a relief! And then he began to beg that the guy on the tree with the spear would help him quickly. Everyone died. Only he and this slave remained. All this time while he quickly said the monster devoured his leg, Raymond asked for forgiveness for what happened, and he was generally against it. He also said that he couldn't get out of here alone. He needed to work together. While Raymond felt incredible pain because he was being devoured by a monster, he just looked at that poor fellow and did nothing. Raymond loudly shouted at him to stop standing there with his hands folded, and called that slave a piece of shit. But the slave only smiled at these words, he jumped from the tree. Then he came closer to the guy and said that no matter how much he wanted to save him, but it seems it's too late. After all, the monster has already devoured half of that poor guy's body. Raymond looked down and saw his reflection in the pool of blood. Realizing that he was about to die, he began to lose his mind and shouted that he was a very stupid slave. Does he really believe that he can survive alone? His turn will come to him. And immediately after these words, the monster made another jerk and simply shredded Raymond, killing him completely. But this huge creature was not enough of this food. He also wanted to feast on the slave. A huge but fast creature prepared to jump. Then it rushed straight towards the guy who was standing with a spear in his hand. But the guy with black hair was absolutely calm. He said that he thought that he could survive. He pointed his spear straight at that huge beast and went through it, making a huge hole in the beast. A feathered creature with horns just dropped dead not far from this guy. Having stained his face and clothes with blood, he straightened his hair and said that this was not the place where he died. And now let's move to a completely different place. But this place was no less sinister. Several armed men stood on the edge of the cliff. At the very edge stood a man in a black cloak. Creatures that looked very much like flying lizards were approaching them. There were also huge creatures that looked like demons from the underworld. They were of all sizes from small to incredibly huge. Among them, one huge dragon especially stood out. It was the Horntail, also known as the King of Dragons. 
One of those guys said that it turns out that the Centauri nest was also destroyed. They have no one else to rely on here, starting with the Knights of Cygnus, the resistance of the crusade hunters and adventurers, and ending with the six heroes on whom people pinned their hopes. A woman approached this man who was standing on the edge of the cliff and said that everyone was dead. She looked at his back and said that he was the only one left. This was the last adventurer. His name was Elpham. And finally he said that they would now go forward, because the last adventure awaited them. The incredibly huge dragon had already noticed its prey and was flying straight towards those people. He opened his huge mouth wide and growled so that the earth began to cower. Then there was a battle in which there were huge losses. Elpham was on his knees, covered in blood and breathing heavily. Around him were the dead bodies of his assistants who could not survive this battle and right in front of this guy lay the huge head of a ferocious dragon in which there was no longer any life. Elpham raised his eyes to the mountain asking just one question, is this the end? As it turned out, it was a three-headed dragon, and our hero managed to cut off one head. They survived the heavy blow but managed to cut off one head, only to see it regenerate. He thought that all their efforts were in vain, and the huge creature again headed straight towards him. Elpham realized that this was definitely the end. He simply closed his eyes, resigning himself to what was about to happen. He thought that this was the end of his world, and also the end of the adventure. But getting angry, he hit the ground very hard with his fist. A rather large dent formed at the site of the impact. The guy said that it was some kind of curse. He was incredibly golden. He still did not want to come to terms with the fact that everything could end like this. After all, what then was the sacrifice of all those who were next to him? Philip, Jaden and Elysis, they all gave their lives, resigned to the fact that this was their last battle. Elpham raised his head up the mountain and shouted loudly that he refused to accept it. He looked with incredible anger at the huge dragon, which was growing another head. He turned to the horntail and said that he would not die just like that. The guy with black hair used his power and concentrated it in his hand. He then swung, creating a huge arrow to launch at his enemy. He shouted that he would kill this dragon even if it was the last thing he could do. Well, the amount of enormous radiated energy that he used did not remain without a trace. He suffered an internal hemorrhage and blood began pouring out of his mouth. The dragon, using one of its heads which was in the middle, wanted to incinerate its opponent. He began to spew out a huge amount of ancient magic which he aimed at Elpham. Our hero saw in front of him a huge ball that was supposed to smear him into powder. What a pitiful sight! Why should the end be exactly like this? And if only it had more power. If he could start all over again, he tried to change something. With these thoughts, he died in that world, but suddenly he heard someone shouting at him to get up, then splashed water on him. After looking around, the guy realized that he was in a completely different place. There were shackles on his hands. The man who was throwing a bucket of water at him said that he knows that this brat is healthy. He is just a bait slave and you shouldn't forget your place. Elpham didn't understand what happened at all. Where did the horntail go? He didn't understand why he was even alive. Looking around, he heard talk that they had brought a new product. This is an excellent choice for a long trip to the dungeon. Elpham tried to move his hands. Well, I realized that these shackles would not be so easy to remove. He was in a cage and they looked at him like some kind of animal. Are these people really choosing slaves for themselves? Is this really a place where they sell people? Elpham tried to realize what was going on here. It seemed to him that all this was some kind of nonsense. He thought that such markets had already been banned a long time ago. But he was completely sure that this was such a market. He began to analyze the situation. If he understood everything correctly, then this man with a nose piercing was probably a merchant. And he bought it at the market six years ago. When he was already a slave, this is definitely him. Then he actually went back in time. The merchant got angry because this guy was looking at him for so long. Because of this, he entered the cage and asked him what the hell he was staring at, then hit him on the head very hard. He realized that this was precisely the moment when it all began. Or perhaps he was dreaming all this, but he had two real sensations to be just a fantasy. And then the same group of people who ultimately bought him from this market approached him. The guy thought that this didn't make sense but he didn't see any other explanation. The seller said that he received these slaves not so long ago, and they were relatively fresh, then they were bought. Elpham about the fact that it looks like he was given a chance. It looks like he needs to fix everything this time. Now let's return to the very place where our hero killed that huge monster with a spear. 
He walked around the area and found the fire arrow staff. It was a good ability, and this thing will suit him perfectly now, he threw it over his shoulder. But this is still not enough, the adventure group probably took other things with them. They still plan to collect more goods here. He also remembered that some people hide valuables in their shoes, and he found a ring in one of his shoes which he put on his finger. Alpum looked at the ring and it began to shine, he realized that it was a telekinesis ring. Suddenly he heard a noise coming from the bushes, and when he had seen enough, he noticed other ferocious creatures. He understood that they must have come to the smell of blood, they would have to fight. They quickly ran towards him to tear him to pieces, but the guy was ready. He began to repel their attacks and chop these creatures into pieces like a meat grinder. When the huge creatures began to use their long sticky tongues during the battle, this worsened the situation. One of those animals grabbed the spear that was in the hands of our hero, and this spear was successfully torn into pieces which scattered in different directions. Alpum was even surprised by the power of such a creature. He realized that it would be difficult for him to defeat them all, and behind him there was another creature that was already trying to bite off his head. Alpum grabbed the weapon he found and used a fire arrow. He managed to save his life by killing the monster that almost bit off his head, but others also attacked him. Now is a good time to try out the ring he found. With the help of this ring, he was able to control the arrow and direct it at his opponents. Thus, he was able to quickly pierce several creatures at once with one movement of his hand. But this arrow could not maintain its strength for a long time. It simply dried up. Elpum understood that if he was not held back for a long time, the creatures would continue to try to tear him apart. He wanted to activate the fire arrow again, but for some reason this time it didn't work out for him. Therefore, he struck that creature first with his staff and then finished it off with his foot. The staff is not broken. It seems to have a cooldown time. Then he decided to attack these creatures with his staff until it recharged. There was no choice. Alpum himself looked like a beast in this battle, and those guys who attacked him were no longer happy about such a meeting. And after some time of this battle, he felt that the staff was charging. He lifted it up the mountain and was ready to attack his opponent. The creatures began to approach him again. They wanted to finally end this. Alpum fired a fiery arrow and again used the power of that same ring to destroy the remaining creatures. This time he accelerated to destroy as many of these creatures as quickly as possible at once. The power of the staff ran out again, and he again could not release these arrows for some time. But he no longer needed this, he simply stood surrounded by the dead bodies of those creatures. Suddenly he heard someone's voice address him. It was the same girl who was wounded by the beast. She said that this was an unusual bait slave. Alpum was surprised that she was still alive. She said through the pain that this combat ability and magic are incomparable to anything. Who the hell is he? Alpum thought that this was a very lucky girl, although he should take back his words. The girl who was seriously injured asked why he had this staff, and also he had rings around his wrist. How could the decoy slave awaken such powers? The girl asked in a trembling voice, was it really because of him that the anomaly happened? Alpum looked at her, thinking about what he should do. Now the fate of this girl is in his hands. A stronger wind began. Our hero asked if she had finished what she wanted. The girl didn't understand what he was talking about. But our hero said that he was afraid that she was mistaken. It didn't even matter if the others remained alive. Because he was going to kill her anyway. After all, she used people as bait to survive. Alpum said in a menacing voice that he despises people like her. When it was all over and our hero managed to find a way out, he went back to the city. The guys who noticed him were very surprised. Is this really true? They did not believe that the decoy slave returned alive from there alone. Elpum thought that the die had been cast. He needed to act quickly so that this would not be his fate. But everything should be done in order. He came to one large building in this city. Holding a staff in his hand, he wanted to get rid of the status of a slave. When he entered that building... They asked him to wait. They were trying to clarify the situation. The man who sat at the table and lit a cigar and said did this rap come back alive? His assistant said that everything was true. This is always the case and the man said that according to this man, he came unharmed. Then his interlocutor named Mr. Abbey said what's wrong with this? Is this the first time that the decoy slave returned without injury? Then the man always said that all the adventurers from the team he was in died at the gate. Then the man with a cigar asked that he really wanted to say that this slave survived alone. This is really strange, and also strange that he decided to provide a report about not escaping. 
those who have become slaves due to huge debts cannot avoid the fate of being used as bait again. Since he didn't try to escape, it means he realizes how difficult it is to hide from them. In the end, death is the only path to freedom for them. Always in the man said that business was being carried out in their trading guild Gapor. Is it really necessary to report to him on such trifles? But the assistant said that the gentleman should know something else. He also learned that this slave awakened the first circle. The man with the cigar was very surprised. He didn't understand. Did this decoy slave awaken the first circle? The man with the cigar was thinking that he probably had a bad opinion of their guild since he was a slave. The assistant also said that he was told that that slave was asking to change his contract. The slave wants to register as an adventurer. The man with the eye patch was very surprised. Who the hell does he think he is? The assistant said that Mr. Larkin wanted Abbeys to deal with this situation personally. Then Abbeys jumped to his feet and asked did Mr. Larkin himself say this? He wondered why the executive head of the guild would be interested in a stinking slave. Looking at the stack of papers, he thought a little more and came to a conclusion. The assistant left his office and closed the door behind him. The man with the eye patch thought aloud that the decoy slave yearned to become an adventurer. In the name of Emperor Cygnus, slavery was abolished, but only conditionally. People have always been slaves of money, they have always thirsted for gold, and were ready to do anything for it. Those who could not pay on time were obliged to work off the gold. This simple law led to non-caste slaves in the world of Maple. When our hero's father, the only family he had died of illness, he became one of them. Elpham purchased an ingredient called Black Moss from the Gapor Trade Guild to cure his father, promising to pay later. The guild demanded a million gold coins, which was several times the market price. The defendant failed to pay the merchant guild one million coins on time, and therefore will have to perform work for the guild within a set time. For six years these scumbags exploited him day after day, and also mocked him. Elpham thought that it was time for him to take revenge for this. Elpham sat opposite Abbey's and said that he was at his service. He realized who he was sitting in front of now and thought that he was a faithful servant of one of the executive heads of the guild. Not bad at all. The man with the eye patch said that he heard that Elpham wanted to change the contract. Therefore, he wanted to get straight to the point since he had already been told enough about this slave. The bearded man then said that he would register him as an F-rank adventurer. Elpham reflected that he agreed to his application quite easily, and thanked his interlocutor. However, our hero wanted to clarify something. He demanded the E rank. He understood in advance that the game would go exactly according to his rules and not according to the rules of these scumbags. Then his interlocutor asked why he needed rank E. Even the Association of Adventurers did not officially recognize him. Elpham replied that he had come to the gate as a bait slave hundreds of times over the past three years. His interlocutor replied that everything was correct. He came there as bait, but he was still new to killing monsters. Our hero asked since when our adventurers judged by their ability to hunt monsters. The first seeker earned great glory through his survival skills, the main goal of any adventurer to return alive and after the processions. The man with the eye patch thought that this was really true, the information that the survivor would bring at the cost of military merit. He said that this was reasonable. Then he said that to be honest, the fact that this slave survived and came back a bunch of times being bait is a great achievement. But that's all. Bait's only taken to the gates of the lower level. Does he really believe that his insignificant survival skills will save his ass in the gates of the high level? He began to take out a cigar and said that this guy is very mistaken if he mistakes their guild for credence who will sign a contract with a self-confident idiot. This man closed his cigarette and said, looked at the guy, thinking that if he continues to overestimate himself, he will die very soon. However, his intuition told him something about this guy. By this he said that there is a gate with a limit of five people and twelve marks on the tree trunk. Then he smiled and said that everything is correct. This means that at least twelve groups of five people went there and did not return. The bearded man turned to the slave and told him to prove to him that he was worthy of the rank he was asking for. If Elpham succeeds, he will correct his wish, and at the same time he handed him a piece of paper. Elm of time, he immediately found guys to join. Those guys turned to him and said that he must be the same newcomer who joined them. One of them, a blonde man with green eyes, said that he was glad to meet you. His name is Chev, and he is the tank of their team. And Mr. Abbeys also told him that he was a bait slave. But there is no need to worry about this, because he doesn't care about it, just like his comrades. Elpham said that he was glad to meet them, 
and his interlocutor also said that he had also heard that he could use fire magic. Alpam replied that everything was correct, then a dark-skinned man with white hair asked whether any magic is inaccessible with a poppy seed. Shev said that this is not true, they can only control the element to which they are predisposed from birth, which is why it is useless for them to take an object that does not match their element. But he moved away from the topic and said that it's possible that our hero already knows their goal on this mission is hunting monsters. They need to return the items that were dropped by the other twelve teams that went here before them. When they collect all those things, their work will be over. The guild is ready to pay three thousand coins for each item. The dark-skinned man said that this was a robbery in broad daylight. They would have been left without any items at all if it weren't for them. Besides, those guys had one circle each, which means their items cost at least seven thousand. The man with a scar on his face told him that he should stop complaining. Then the man with white hair said that he did not complain. Then the head of this team told them all to calm down, and it was time to earn some money. Immediately they entered that portal and found themselves in a completely different world. It was very light here, but still somehow creepy. The commander said that everyone should listen to him. It is very likely that the task will be delayed. Judging by the terrain, it is necessary to set up a camp. One said that they should set up camp at the top of a tree. There are many branches and they can hide behind them, and from above it will be more convenient to look for better places. And they agreed with this proposal and immediately began to do just that. A blonde man with dark skin approached our hero, put his hand on his shoulder, then said that he could rest, because he and this pizza behind were experts in construction. And after some time, they built a truly good shelter. Now that everything was ready, they had to split into two groups and explore the area. The commander said that Tom, Max, and Roa would all go together. The commander and Alpum will check the western side, and the other group will check the eastern side. If something happens, let them immediately give a signal and quickly return to base. Then everyone understood what they needed to do. They agreed with this and hit the road. The green-eyed man looked around and thought that there were almost no monsters here. He said that they probably set up camp too close to the entrance. Tomorrow they will go deeper into the forest. He then asked our hero how was his first assignment as an adventurer. Elpum, with an absolutely calm face, said that he was nervous. Then his interlocutor smiled and said that he understood him. Shev said that he still sometimes worries every time he enters the gate, even though he has gained a little experience. But he is not the bravest man in the world. But he continues to boldly take a step forward because he is surrounded by people who are important to him. He doesn't know how it sounds from the outside but all his comrades are really good. He really felt very sorry when he first heard the story of Elpham, but it's even hard to imagine how hard it was for him. Shev walked ahead of our hero and then stopped and said that if he wanted, he could always join them. When he looked at Elpham, he noticed that he was standing near some small hole that someone had recently dug. Shev laughed and said that we shouldn't take his words too seriously. After some time, night came and they sat down under a tree to make a fire but they failed to find anything. The head of this team said that maybe they should avoid talking about work, at least over a meal. Elpham still had not freed himself from the shackles on his neck. He still walked with him, and that evening he drank only water. When everyone had a snack, they went to bed to gain strength. But not everyone went to bed. Some kind of creaking was heard. Someone was approaching our hero. This was the head. He approached the place where our hero did not fully address him. He asked if he was sleeping. Behind him there were still his other companions. Elpham did not make a sound, and it seemed that he was sleeping very soundly. The same white-haired man with black skin approached him and said that why was the commander asking these questions? He held a large knife in his hand and said that you don't know that Elpham was too fast asleep to answer. He told the commander that he was too careful. Did he really forget that they gave him dinner? This thing is powerful enough to give way to the giant mush mom. He literally ate everything clean. He was lucky that he remained alive. For his staff of fire arrows they can get at least ten thousand gold coins. Then this man with white hair swung his knife to kill our hero. And immediately he plunged his blade straight into Alpham's body. He felt that something was clearly wrong here. What was the matter? When he put away the sleeping bag, he noticed that there was just a piece of wood and two pillows. And he wasn't there. They were all very surprised. How could this be? The commander shouted for them to find this freak. He must be somewhere nearby. As soon as he said this, a loud explosion immediately sounded, knocking everyone off their feet. Our hero watched all this from another tree, 
He watched as those guys who wanted to kill him were now in danger. They quickly began to rise on their feet, not understanding what the hell. The commander said that they needed to quickly save food and other valuable things. Did Elpham really do this? A man with black hair who froze in place turned to the commander and pointed his finger somewhere to the side. When the commander looked at who saw the huge eye of a creepy creature in front of him, he was confused at this moment. He said that this Elpham is a scumbag. A huge strange and sticky creature was approaching them to devour them. They screamed that this fool was using them as bait to lure out the monster. They jumped off that tree and started falling down because they saw that monster coming. A huge slippery monster with a quick movement in its mouth simply tore apart their cover. Elpham, watching what was happening, thought that the actor from Chev was terrible. He shouldn't have shown kindness if he wanted to deceive him. This gate finished off twelve teams. They welcomed the former decoy and not the one with the most experience with open arms. How obvious it is. Our hero correctly guessed that this monster is the boss of the dungeon. The guys jumped to the ground and began to quickly run away. The commander shouted that this was the worst type of monster for them. His assistant with black hair turned to his boss and asked what he knew about this monster. Chev said that if he was not mistaken, then it was a golden slime mold. His body is made of acid, making him the worst enemy for them fighting in close combat. And that's not all. Chev noticed that something dangerous was flying right towards the meeting. He threw his comrade aside shouting to be careful here. They fell to the ground. The man with black hair was shocked by this. As it turned out, he can attack from a distance, acid arrow, an ability that shoots acid. Then the man with black hair screamed in panic that it was so unfair. Chev shouted for everyone to start panicking. He was advancing again, right while they were running away. They were thinking about what they should do in this situation and how they could defeat him. The head said that first they need to get out of the attack radius. They had acid arrows reload time one minute. You need to get into a combat formation and destroy the core located in the center of his head. A man with white hair and black skin said that it was good that he had recharge. Then Max rushed forward before the time ran out. He said what should they wait for. He decided to finish him off right now and rushed alone over his huge monster. The commander shouted that he should wait. We all need to act together. And so he didn't even have time to get to that monster when it was immediately torn apart by its two parts. The commander was shocked by what he saw, but he had a reload time, he still had about ten seconds, and then that monster started attacking them with his acid arrows one by one, and in an instant he simply killed all those guys who came under this blow. Elpham stood behind the tree and watched all this, he realized that those guys were finished. He thought that in theory Chev was right, but the golden slime mold became stronger with each item it absorbed. It is quite expected that the recharge time could be reduced unpredictable growth and the ability to fire acid arrows of recharge. It seems Elpham understood why the previous teams died. This monster is not from their league. In this state, he will be able to hold out in these yellow gates, which are two levels lower than the red ones, and he doubts that adventurers with one circle will be able to defeat him. No objects could be returned from this gate. He realized that the task was over, and then he remembered that man with a cigar who wanted the guy to prove it to him. Elpham figured out what he would do. While that slime mold looked around, our hero acted. Then the monster heard some noise and began to carefully look for the source of this noise. But he didn't have time to react, and a huge exchange arrow hit him directly. The slime mold was injured, its body parts dripping onto the ground and burning through it. He was in great pain and growled in pain. Elpham was aiming for the core, but this monster has impressive magic resistance. It will take at least four more shots or even five to defeat him. Elpham grabbed the knife and thought that this shouldn't be a problem. But he doesn't mind getting evidence that he destroyed this monster. The angry slime mold began to attack our hero with its acid arrows. Naturally, our hero dodged such an attack and jumped to the ground. Slizerick continued to attack with all his powers. He was furious and in pain. Elpham fell to the ground and right in flight he dodged those attacks of that creature. He already had a plan in mind. He grabbed the rope and used the power of his ring. Each shot must land in the same place, something a simple magician can only dream of. Well, our hero is not simple. In a past life he was known as the greatest telekineticist. With sharp and skillful movements and a knife that he tied to this rope, he then, with the help of the ring, began to evade the attacks of this creature. And after a moment he took aim with his bow and released a fiery arrow. He hit this creature again and the terrible beast roared loudly, 
and then began to continue shooting acid arrows at his opponent. Elpham dodged very quickly and waited for his fire weapon to reload, and after some time he again used the fiery arrow, and again he hit his opponent. This was already the third arrow. The terrible creature made of acid slowly decreased in size, but at the same time, she was not going to give up. This creature constantly attacked our hero. Elpham waited again to reload. All this time he dodged the attacks and finally fired another fire arrow. But this time that creature managed to dodge the fiery arrow. Elpham thought that this creature was quite agile for its size, but it was no use. He used the power of his levitation ring and redirected the arrow back at the creature. And finally, he saw the very core that he needed. As soon as he saw this cannonball, he immediately rushed straight to meet the enemy. His staff caught fire, and our hero said out loud that this was the end. He was already very close to the core, but the terrible creature tried to heal the wound in order to hide the core. At some point, our hero realized that he would not have time to grab the core and, moreover, this creature would now grab him with its huge paw. Therefore, he again used the levitating ring to evade. He threw away the blade that was tied to the rope and controlled it to move in the air. Thus, he quickly changed his trajectory and the creature could not attack him. Alpum was the main thing and quickly landed on the ground. He was already ready to use the properties. And again he shot a fiery arrow. The creature understood that he could not escape. Alpum smiled when he saw that this creature covered himself with his hand. He quickly used his limiting ring to change the trajectory of the arrow and aimed straight for the head. And again there was an explosion. A huge creature received crushing damage. The core of this creature was no longer protected and could be easily destroyed. But it was precisely that decisive arrow that put an end to the existence of this creature. The creature swelled greatly in size and roared loudly. And then it just exploded like a balloon that had been pumped up too much air. Elpham began to quickly run away from that acidic mucus so as not to harm himself. Faster and faster he moved like a bird using a levitating ring. Then he released the blade further to catch on a tree. And so he jumped out onto a tree just at the moment, when the whole earth beneath him was flooded with acid. Elpham looked absolutely calmly at what happened. He understood that he had already defeated this creature. The acid was spilling for many meters around. It was dangerous to step on the ground now. Very quickly this acid scorched every living thing it touched. When the acid was a little absorbed into the ground, Elpham descended to the ground to explore the area. He needed just one thing. He looked around and finally found what he needed. In order not to go far, he simply pulled this little thing to himself with the help of his ring. It was this very core that he managed to extract from this monster. He carefully took it into his hand, making sure that this core was no longer in the acid. It shone here in his hand with a red light. Elpham knew what to do with it. This thing can take him to a new level of power. A mysterious sphere flew into the air and then enveloped our hero in a red glow. And finally, after some time, Elpham returned to the man whom he promised that he would return from there. A man with a cigar sat opposite our hero and looked at him silently. He was surprised that this guy was actually able to return, and said that this means that he not only knows how to talk, but he returned again alone, and without the items he had agreed to return. Elpham replied that the team to which he was introduced consisted of absolute beginners. They tried to kill him to take his item. It seems they met a boss monster and died while running away from it. A man with an eye patch asked his interlocutor if he had seen that monster. Elpham replied that he saw what kind of creature it was. It was a golden slime mold. Now the man with a cigar in his mouth realized that all the objects that were left over from the previous guys were corroded by acid. Then that man with the cigar thought that he couldn't believe that I had lost my children. All the items that I had put aside for those people were a huge loss. And the fact that this guy also returned is another problem. Several universal rules apply to all brothers. Firstly, each gate has its own limit on the number of people entering. It is indicated on the trunk in front of the entrance. When the limit is reached, the gate is deactivated until all those entering die. Secondly, there is a restriction on which adventurers can enter the gate of a certain color. The difficulty of the gate varies from red to purple. If the adventurer's rank exceeds the allowed tone, they will not be able to enter the gate. Thirdly, the adventurer is given only one chance to clear the gates. This is the main difficulty associated with their capture. As soon as someone comes out alive, they immediately disappear, and no one else can enter there, and another opportunity is given only when all team members died at the gate. And now let's return to our hero, 
The man who sat in front of him was thinking about the fact that the gates and rewards had disappeared. To be honest, the golden slime mold is too powerful a monster for adventurers with one circle. Then, after these thoughts, he turned to the Alps and said that it is now clear to him, that is, he barely managed to get out of there. This explains why he did not return a single item. But all eyewitnesses were destroyed. I the man with the eye patch said that whatever the reason, Alpum couldn't cope. Alpum answered him that there was no need to rush to a conclusion, because he had not finished speaking yet. Our hero unfastened his leather bracers and wanted to show his interlocutor something. And finally, when he showed him what he wanted, this green-eyed man simply couldn't believe his eyes. As it turned out, Alpum absorbed the golden slime mold, which meant that he killed him. The bearded man shouted that these two circles, had he really absorbed the mana stone that fell out of him? Alpum replied that he thinks this is a great proof of his abilities, and now he wants his interlocutor to register him as an E-rank adventurer. A bearded man with an eye patch said that he would give him D-rank. Alpum now asked what he meant. The man jumped up on the table and said that he would register Alpum under rank D, and if he agreed to work exclusively for him, he would become rank C. Alpum, don't think for long. I started signing the contract that that man gave him. The man with the cigar was thinking that rank C for adventurers without a third circle was prohibitively high. The rank of adventurers is strongly tied to the number of circles. In this world the corresponding number of circles of power varies greatly. However, this guy is clearly an exception. Not everyone can get a circle by consuming a mana stone. Plus he has an instinct for self-preservation. This guy is just a diamond. He is significantly superior to those people who came here. He earned the second circle in the blink of an eye immediately after the first. He has an unheard of speed of development. The man with the cigar smiled and thought about hiring him. Meanwhile, Alpum was thinking that everything was going better than he expected. This man clearly needed him. He himself understood that it would be useful very soon. He knew what would happen next. The first conquest of the Red Gate for 100 people will take place soon. If his memory serves him right, then around this time there will be a huge event in which all the trade and adventure guilds in Lith will be interested. Gapor will also probably turn his attention to it. This is not bad at all, because he is also in a hurry, and it would not hurt him to speed up the execution of his plan a little. Elpum turned to Mr. Abbeys and said that he wanted to ask him for a favor. Elpum was now broke, that is, he had nothing at all. He extended his hand and said that he wanted to put money aside from his interlocutor. Ebby smiled when he heard this, but he did it somehow faintly. He himself was thinking about this. Did this brat really ask him for money? While some argue that the appearance of the brother gave birth to an era of adventure. In fact, they are a trap set by a dark magician. Many adventurers died in the gates, slowly but surely robbing the world of Maple of its potential. And then the day of the apocalypse came. A huge number of monsters, as if waiting for this moment, got out of the gate, and they were defeated. The described event will happen exactly three years later. The tragic fate of Maple, who is destined to collide with her, is just around the corner. After the conversation, Elpum left his interlocutor's office and moved on. He walked and Abby's watched him from the window, about to light another cigarette. Elpum understood that he had a long way to go, but he thought that this would be enough to start implementing his plans. The recently found gate for 100 people is red, which means that only those with two circles or less can enter there. The Gap or Trade Guild usually hires high-ranking adventurers. The only reason to invest in it is that they are targeting this gate. Our hero finally has money, but he needs to manage it wisely. You shouldn't spend it all at once. Truly useful items are too expensive. Then what is the best thing to spend your saved money on? Alpum went to the place where people were sold. It was a market. He understood that this place was simply terrible. People were being trafficked here. A man immediately approached him with a smile and greeted our hero, then said that he was glad to welcome him to the labor market. He also said that the man he was talking to looked like he was looking for adventure and wanted to help him. Elpum looked around and noticed how people were bargaining among themselves for other people. They had separate bait slaves or partners who would fight with them side by side. Elpum said that he was looking for a certain person and wanted to be taken to him. A man in a red headband asked who exactly should he be taken to, and so we see that our hero immediately went to the dungeon where the punitive premises were located. He sends the most problematic people there for correctional purposes, and the one our hero is looking for is one of them. After walking around this gloomy place for a short time, 
they finally arrived at their destination. They came to one of the cells and there was a muscular man tied up in chains. The seller asked if the gentleman was sure that he was looking for this particular person. Elpham looked at this big guy and told him that he was looking for him. The death of one person hastened the destruction of Maple's world in our hero's past life. Aaron this is the heroine of the halberd. This mighty woman was killed, and the criminal turned out to be none other than her only student. It was a murder hero named Dibois. This incident marked the beginning of the end. A muscular man in shackles turned to our hero and asked was he really looking for him? And then he said that they had never seen each other before and that he should get out of here. The seller turned to our hero and said that she was asking for his forgiveness. But this ignoramus should get some manners. He will earn a position with Slava. After a few years, while he is in slavery, he still dares to seek or seek adventures that may become his master. The term impudent does not fully reflect his character. The seller said that this is just a savage and even an arrogant barbarian. Elpham smiled when he heard the words of this man, thinking that it was not for nothing that they called him that. After all, he was the most influential person after our hero when the apocalypse happened. People often compared them because they are both from the same region and have a lot in common, from when they awakened their powers to how strong they became. But there is one main similarity that we will learn about a little later. Elpham asked what is the price of this man. The freed man with scars said angrily that it looks like this fool is from a rich family. Is he really sure that he can afford to buy him? After all, it costs one million gold. Too expensive for this filthy bastard? Elpham reflected that they both desperately needed money at one time or another. His little sister is suffering from the black blood plague which is slowly killing her. A casual man in shackles said that if his buyer has no money, let him get lost. Elpham opened the bag which contained a lot of money. In one package he had one million local currency. Everyone was very surprised. The seller asked if you were confident, sir, in your decision. The man in shackles didn't understand whether this was a real person and whether it was possible. The angry man then closed his mouth and began to worry. Elpham said that he was too early to admire. He had not finished yet and demanded a contract for a year, a division of profits seven to three, and the transfer of all items obtained from the gates to Elpham. The merchant was very surprised when he realized that this man was trying to hire that prisoner as a crew member and not a slave. Our hero wrote everything down on paper and then handed this contract to the slave and told him to read it carefully. The surprised man in shackles quickly snatched this piece of paper from his hands and told him not to take back his words. He quickly bit his finger with his teeth and didn't even think about this decision. He quickly put a signet with his blood. It looks like he is in a hurry to take care of his little sister. Elpham smiled. That's exactly what he needed, without further ado. Elpham turned to his new team member and said that the contract had been signed, so they would immediately go to the gate. His interlocutor replied that he had been waiting for this and was ready to go right now. Elpham turned to him and said that he would have to prove his worth, and he called him by the name of Dibwa. The U.S. man did not say that he was the most dexterous person his interlocutor had ever met, and so they went on their adventure, each of them pursuing his own goal. They walked through a dense forest and Debo decided to hold a huge axe in his hand. He turned to our hero and calling her boss and said that he likes the new weapon but with a long sword he feels more confident in himself. Shouldn't he have mastered something in which he has more experience? Elpham said that while he works for him, he will only use a halberd, but if he is against it, then they can terminate the contract. They came to this gate, and Debo asked if they would train at this gate. Elpham approached the red gate with one mark with a limit of eight people this particular gate would suit them. Debo asked what about the other team members. Because if it costs one million to buy him, then he is sure that he has enough money to hire others. Then he asked if there would be a healer with them, because there are many healers. But our hero was simply silent. Debo tensed at that moment, he thought, could it be just the two of them there? Elpam answered him that he did not need to worry. They had enough people on the team to clear these gates. Debo he breathed a sigh of relief and said that the boss scared him. Elpham pointed his finger at Debo and said that the two of them would be enough. Debo froze for a few seconds in surprise. He hoped that the boss was just joking. His heart began to beat faster. He asked is this a joke? Elpham didn't want these long conversations and he simply kicked his accomplice and told him to stop wasting his time and finally go forward. Debo, out of surprise, did not have time to react and began to fall into that portal. Finally, they found themselves in a completely new world 
surrounded by the dry desert and stones. Debo landed head first and our hero followed him. Debo shouted in rage, Has Elpham really lost his mind? What can the two of them do in a gate designed for eight? Where is his serious approach to business? First he decided to take his weapon, which he was not used to. Suddenly there was a noise behind Debo and dust flew into the air. A whole crowd of living stumps began to move right towards them. Debo realized that it sounded like his cry and brought these. They are known for their resistance to weapons like blades. But there are a whole lot of them here. Elpham pushed his assistant away and told him to step aside. He was heading straight towards these stumps. Debo didn't understand what he was doing. Elpham used a fire arrow and immediately began to smash these creatures to pieces. These stumps were created by sorcerers. They were once ordinary trees, but now everything has changed. Elpham used the levitation ring again and began to exterminate a whole horde of these stumps. Debo just looked in shock at everything that was happening. When our hero destroyed the creature that was attacking them, he turned to his interlocutor. He told him that it was very sad that he started screaming as soon as he entered the gate. Let him not make such a mistake again, because he simply attracts monsters. Debo didn't understand who the hell this man was, but let's move to a slightly different place. The woman, on her knees, turned to her boss and said that the trade guild had taken the bait. They were thinking over the implementation schedule, and among them were their own people. I listened attentively to a man who stood at the window and held a glass of wine in his hand. She turned to him and asked if he would allow him to proceed with the plan. This man also had red eyes, looked at the girl, and said that he allowed it. Then the woman bowed her head before him and began to disappear like a shadow. This man with long gray hair raised a glass of wine to the mountain and said that his will will be done. He looked at the moon and said that they will free the world of maple. Well now let's get back to our hero who just single-handedly defeated an entire army of wild creatures. Debo wasted no time and collected twenty-seven mana stones that would be useful to them in the future. Elpham did not stand in one place for long. He said that they should move on. Debo agreed with everything his new boss told him. They had already been traveling around the world for some time. Debo thought about what he thought was an ordinary man-man. But he is an amazing man. It was telekinesis. He had never heard of such a use of fire arrow. If he travels with this guy, he will definitely earn a lot of money. Because he gets 30% of the income, this will cover the cost of treatment. Elpham turned to his assistant and said that they were here. They found a bunch more stumps. Debo counted them and there were nine of them. All these creatures now seemed to be sleeping. Elpham said that this was a suitable number, and his interlocutor asked what he was talking about. Elpham looked carefully at his interlocutor. Let him understand that now it is his turn to chop wood. First, Debo threw a pebble to distract the attention of these creatures. I just got distracted by the stump and he immediately jumped on it to chop it into pieces. Having cut one, the other stumps also woke up and began to move towards the enemy. Debo thought that his boss was some kind of crazy person. How could he alone defeat them? Especially with a weapon that he picked up for the first time. He wouldn't survive even with nine lives like a cat. He has a terrible boss. Elpham looked at this whole battle and thought that Debo would take a long time to master the halberd. But soon he will understand that this is the best type of weapon for him. You don't even need to think about how much potential he has. After all, he was the only one whom the heroine of the halberd accepted as students. Meanwhile, our hero's assistant was still fighting with those terrible creatures. And yet he succeeded. Even for a moment he thought that the halberd was not so bad. It hits at a distance and quite strongly. It is much more convenient with it than with a sword. It lies easier in the hand since there is no need to apply force. He tried new techniques and wondered what would happen if he swung even more smoothly than before. And he did it this way. He got better and better. He just chopped down all those creatures as if they were some kind of ordinary firewood. Elpham watching the battle thought that he quickly grasped the essence. And this even before the awakening of the circle. Right in the middle of the battle, Debo felt some kind of earthquake. He began to lose his balance. He looked up the mountain. He noticed that the birds flew into the air as if something had frightened them. Suddenly, from the rock next to which they were standing, some unknown thing cursed. And then the one who climbed out of that rock threw Debo aside. He didn't understand what the hell was going on here. What kind of creature was this? When he took a better look at this creature, he realized that there was a stump in front of him. This stump began to attack the one who came into this world without an invitation. 
The muscular guy did not have time to dodge. Elpam used his ring to throw him aside and save his life. And then he used his staff saying that being big is not always good. You need to shoot a fire arrow. They say that if you are so big, you become an easy target. Debo, who still had not risen from the floor, thought that he was right. Fire magic should work. Well, suddenly something happened that they did not expect. The stump simply knocked off the arrow. Elpum thought that the creature's reflexes were better developed than it might seem when he decided to try again. He released the arrow and used telekinesis to change the trajectory of the arrow. And now everything should have worked out. The target almost reached the head of this creature. But the stump reacted again and deflected the arrow in mid-flight. Elpum was surprised that this creature stopped this blow. Debo shouted that even magic didn't work here. There's no need to wait, and you need to get away quickly. Elpum thought that it was not a matter of magic. Otherwise, he would not have been able to deflect the arrow. He is disturbed by the branches themselves, which react to the approach of the arrow. The stump tried to kill those two guys with one blow with a powerful blow of its paw. Then the stump swung its branches in order to still destroy the guys who managed to evade. Elpum used his ring of levitation and grabbed the one on which he and his assistant landed. Then he lifted this stone into the air and began to fly on it. Having flown to the side, they managed to evade the attacks. Debo said that this was great. Then he coughed and thanked his boss for helping him because he thought that the end would come for him. Elpum turned to the assistant and told him to deal with the stumps that came here, and he himself would deal with stump. Debo didn't even have time to figure out what happened. He wanted to say something else to his boss, but he quickly moved away from him. Elpum rushed towards his opponent and used his staff to fire another arrow. Debo thought that this was useless. The monster could not be defeated without tactics. He needed to step back and come up with a plan. Stump again repelled the arrow's attack. Debo, who saw what was happening, thought that he was right after all. And then something happened that the stump did not expect. He was wounded after all. Debo, I was surprised to think that it actually worked. Elpum reloaded his staff and prepared for the next shot. At the same time, he thought that this stump was moving its branches faster than he thought. Even telekinesis will not help to strike, and again the enemy repelled the attack. But since our hero now has two circles, he can simultaneously use two abilities. He shot the creature with his arrows again and again, and finally managed to cut off its branch. Debo, who fought with stumps all the time, watched his boss fight. Elpum shot two arrows at a time, he hid one arrow behind the other. Although the monster is agile, he cannot stop two hits in a row. Just think, Sponge is overcome by only one person. Perhaps his base was stronger than he imagined. Debo was tense all the time. He was more interested in what was happening now with his boss. And he noticed something behind him. There were many stumps that were approaching him from behind. Debo shouted at his boss to be careful. There was danger behind him. He thought that he had missed a couple of stumps because there were too many for her. Help him without even turning around, using his arrow, destroyed all those enemies who approached him from behind. Elpum looked at his assistant, and with a disappointed face asked, Is Debo really not able to cope even with ordinary monsters? While our hero was distracted, the stump immediately, without wasting time, rushed straight at him to destroy him. Elpum jumped away from the enemy with quick movements of his legs. He thought that he did not have a moment of peace. The enemy kept advancing and advancing forward and so did our hero. And finally there was an attack from the stump that our hero did not notice. And when he noticed it was too late. But suddenly he was saved by Debo, who managed to notice the danger and cut off another branch of this monster with his weapon. The assistant told his boss that he saved his ass. Now they are even. Elpum smiled at his assistant and said that this is good. It means he has recouped his costs. Dibwa and Elpum unanimously said that it was time to end him. And so the guys again continued their battle with this huge monster. The monster dodged and tried to deflect the arrows, but he did not always succeed. While ours was nodding and forging this creature, Dibwa was chopping up the huge monster in every possible way. In this way they managed to give this creature a good beating. Debo did not have time to react to the creature very quickly, and she began to attack him from both sides. Elpum turned to his assistant and shouted that he would take care of what was on the right. Such words were enough for the assistant to understand everything. Elpum cut the branch that was on the right, and his assistant cut the branch that was on the left. Debo jumped up and attacked his opponent in every possible way. He did it very quickly and epically. And it seems he got used to his new weapon because he wielded it like a professional. Well, he still didn't keep track of such an enemy, 
and the creature hit him with its branch right in the area of the kidneys. Debo screamed in pain and suffered internal hemorrhage. Because of this, he lost his balance and began to fall down. A huge creature already wanted to eat this guy. Elpham grabbed a boulder that was not far from him and made his assistant land on this boulder. But the huge creature broke the cobblestone with its paw and it began to fall down. Elpham was already starting to get angry. He used the power of levitation and thought about how annoying this monster is. He lifted many stones into the air along with Debo in order to guide his assistant to the goal. Debo realized what he needed to do and began to jump on these cobblestones as if on steps. While Elpham fired his fiery arrow and distracted the enemy's attention, Debo acted from the other side. Elpham shouted to his assistant and said that it was time to put an end to it. Debo just swung his new weapon and hit his opponent right in the eye. The creature screamed very loudly, because this was indeed exactly the place where he was truly hurt. The creature closed its eyes and the weapon got stuck in its eye. Debo could not resist and he let go of his weapon. He started to fall down and tried to fall on his head and he succeeded. This was not the end yet. It was necessary to finish off this creature while it still couldn't see well. Elpham used the ring and began to pull his assistant's weapon out of the enemy's eye. With a sharp movement of his hand, he sent the weapon straight to its owner. Debo grabbed and epically addressed his opponent. He said that dear one will now receive his dessert. Very quickly he approached the next eye of the enemy, and again dealt him a crushing and hard blow. The stump screamed loudly and began to turn quickly. Debo began to fall down again. Once again he landed on his feet like a cat with his weapon. The monster wanted to survive and destroy his opponents, so he quickly rushed towards Debo. But the assistant did not have time to react, and Elpham again fired two arrows in a row. These arrows hit directly the core that was in the head of this monster. Finally they reached their goal, the stump screamed loudly and they saw its core. Then it caught fire with a bright flame, the wood burns very well. Poisoned and exhausted, Debo was breathing heavily. His boss came up to him and said that he was great. Elpham watched their opponent burn, and his assistant said that the boss was also great. The huge creature fell to the ground, the fire burning incredibly high. Now let's move to another place. In one of the houses the light was still burning through the window in the late evening. It was already very late. The girl was sitting there alone at the table, thinking that she needed to quickly eat and go to bed. Before eating, according to her old tradition, she began to pray to God. And as soon as she said the words of prayer, she immediately felt that someone was knocking on the door. When she went out to see who came there at such a late time, she was very surprised. As it turned out, it was her brother. He was all exhausted, dirty and covered in blood, but alive. As soon as the girl saw her brother who had returned, she grabbed her skirt and squeezed it tightly, trying to hold back her tears. But nothing worked for her. Tears simply flowed like a river from her eyes. Then she rushed to her brother and hugged him tightly. She was very happy to see him. And now let's return to our hero. He also went to the same house. Arriving there and opening the door, he noticed the man's body lying on the bed. He looked sadly at the one who was already lifeless, and he stood there for several minutes. It looks like it was his father who was left alone and died. Death overtook this man not so long ago. He was already decomposing. After some time of silent distance, Elpham decided what he would do next. His after caught fire, he is clearly going to use it now. And he used it to burn this house along with the body of that man. He heard his house burning down, and he was incredibly sad and hurt at that moment. But nothing could be returned. He needed to burn all the bridges and move on. Now let's see what's happening in our new friend's office. And now he's faced with a problem. It's time to send people to the gate for 100 people. But who should he choose? Larkana is responsible for this campaign. Therefore, he must choose the best of the best. This campaign is very important and will attract the attention of everyone from the top ten. There should be epic rank and higher rank items at the human gate. Perhaps even legendary tier items will appear. He thought that if he admitted to himself honestly, it would be very difficult. Natasha's three sisters are from the Goldrich Guild. They are so strong that it is difficult to believe in their rank of the second circle of power. In comparison with them, the adventurers of the second circle from Gapor are even ashamed to be called adventurers. But even without them, the seekers from the ten guilds pose a threat. After all, their guild is the weakest of the ten largest. He looked at the photo of our hero and thought that he didn't want to admit it. Suddenly someone opened the door without knocking and burst into this man's office. He asked who it was. When he saw who was standing in front of him, 
he immediately stood up. It was the same Larkana who actually comes here very rarely. This person immediately asked what is happening with the composition of the group now. He sat down in the place where the man with the bandage was sitting. Her subordinates said that he was asking for forgiveness but he was not ready yet. Larkin said that he usually doesn't take too long with something like this, and also asked how their friend was doing. The man with the eye patch said that he still has reasons to worry. Last time the Chav group was destroyed and since there were no witnesses, it is not possible to establish what exactly happened there. He is certainly talented, but that is not the problem, Larkana asked. Maybe then check him again? You need to find out whether he is crazy or not, and also let his subordinates gather all the candidates. You need to push them a little. Larkana smiled like a demon and said that this time there will be a lot of witnesses. After some time, our hero and his assistant went to the next portal. Dibwa said that this time there were a lot of people. And so they paid attention to our hero and asked, Are they really the fifteen? Those guys looked at them like they were some kind of scum, saying that they were two former slaves. Alpam immediately realized that they were not welcome here. The more experienced the team, the more their confidence grew that the slaves were just a nuisance. They seemed to have one or two circles. They are different from Chef's team. With such abilities they have no need for bait. The head personally came to them and shouted for everyone to gather. He said that he would not rant and now they will conduct a test. Those who demonstrate their abilities will receive a special chance. A man with black hair and a red headband asked what kind of chance do you mean? The man said that this would be a chance to enter the gate for 100 people. Then the guys were surprised that they got such a chance. He also said that this would be a special opportunity for them. Alpam thought, is this man really going to turn this around? After these words, he immediately told them all to enter the portal and begin. This is exactly what the guys did, and they immediately noticed what was in the forest. The man in red pants turned to the woman in the big hat and said that it would be enough to just kill the boss together. Then they should separate and meet when they received the signal. Elpum and his assistant stood silently and watched what was happening here. All participants immediately set off on the road. The leaders say that time is short and time needs to be spent productively. The woman in the hat looked somewhere behind a tree and saw that there was one monster there. She thought that they were just wasting time and immediately got ready to destroy that little monster. She used her staff and destroyed that creature with an energy discharge. She thought it was very boring. She needed to pick up the magic stone and move on. Well, as it turned out, she was completely wrong. She did not destroy the creature, and it was alive. She was very surprised and asked, Did magical attacks not work on him? She wanted to tell her assistant that they should destroy this creature manually. She blew a strong wind. Other creatures sensed the scent of these people and began to crawl out from everywhere. And of course the time came for battle. They fought to save their lives. After some time... They managed to destroy and cut down those creatures manually using blades and arrows. One of those guys said that the monsters are stronger than they expected. What will they do now? The woman in the hat, whose name was Dolan, said that in any case there are too many of these creatures for them. If this continues, their strength will dry out. She also said that the risk is of course very high. We need to break the alliance and kill the boss ourselves. Meanwhile, Elpum was telling this to his assistant. He said that this is exactly what most of the teams would think. Debo said that this would definitely be the case, and not too proud, and he also said whether the boss was going to help him with these creatures. He was just talking. Elpum answered him that there were only three of them here, and he himself was doing a good job. Debo replied that, no matter how it was, they didn't have time to sit out their pants, they needed to move on. Elpum said that it was necessary to destroy all the mobs. Debo said that they would start a boss hunt. They said this at the same time. Debo did not understand what they were talking about. He asked his boss what he saw. He had just spoken about that monster boss. Elpum answered him that others would think so, and they would engage in mass destruction of mobs. Killing the boss is not the only indicator of ability. Hunting small monsters also takes into account. In addition, it can be dangerous to compete with a large number of groups determined to attack the boss. It is difficult to imagine the lengths they will go to restrain each other. Debo agreed and said that this was true. It might be difficult to break through, but he himself thought that the boss was annoying him. But he was right. In addition, our hero felt that great danger emanated from these gates. Meanwhile, another group of guys went to meet the main monster. Dolan, it was the one in the Harry Potter hat who was walking ahead. Her assistant turned to her and told her to look there. 
It was an escape gate, she didn't want to look for it. But if they found it, that's good, it's better to leave a mark on the road. Suddenly, one member of her team began to laugh loudly. Dolan looked at him and asked what was happening to him, if he should be quieter. But for some reason he laughed without impact, like a man-man from a mental hospital. The head approached him and grabbed him by the shoulder. She wanted to calm him down so that he would not attract monsters. But when she looked at him, she saw that his face was all sweaty. He was in tears and he was acting very crazy. And then she noticed that others began to laugh loudly, as if they had gone mad at one moment. Only now did she realize that it was poison, and she realized that she could get out of here alone. While running away, she heard someone scream behind her. It was a huge and terrible monster in the form of a mushroom that emitted poison. There were many holes on the body of that monster. These were the pores from which that poison came. Dolan looked at that monster. She couldn't hold her breath for long and inhaled that poison. Then she also started laughing madly. She stopped. She was already poisoned and her brain did not listen to her. Now she was captured by that monster. Elpum and Dibwa continued their journey. They were focused on what they were doing. Now they were walking near the Grand Canyon. Debo thought, Is this bum not going to fight today? Suddenly our guys saw a signal in the sky. It was a signal to assemble. The guys immediately went to where the signal came from. Debo was surprised that they notified everyone when they found the main monster. Alpum looked closely and noticed that something was wrong here. There was not just one team. All the teams were here except one. The man in the red headband said that it looks like everything is here. Then he begins to explain. One of the women said that the magician Dolan's team is still not there. Then the man said that there was no point in waiting for them. They still found the boss of this area. And that monster, by the way, killed Dolan along with her assistants. This boss is called the Toadstool, an extremely dangerous and ferocious creature. The girl who heard what he just said was scared, not understanding. Is he really telling the truth now? People began to fuss for food. They said that their team did not have enough strength for such a battle. If everything is really like that, then it is useless to try to clear the gate. We need to look for a way out as soon as possible, Debo asked his boss. Is this clown mushroom really that dangerous? Our hero was thinking that it was now clear who it was, since the current level of meeting with the toadstool is more dangerous for them. Because of the poisons and the spores that monsters release around themselves, close combat makes no sense. You can't take him in a tick either. You can kill him only in ranged combat. While Elpum was thinking, his assistant tried in every possible way to attract his attention and find out what everything was what kind of monster is this. A man with a red bandage on his head said that unfortunately this toadstool is standing right in front of the exit gate. The only way to get to it is through it. Debo said that this was not a problem. Just one fire arrow from Elpum and everything would be over. But Elpum told his assistant to shut up. Debo was very angry when they closed his mouth. Elpum said that without a good strategy they would all die. But the fire arrow can't even scratch him. Our hero's assistant was very surprised and asked why. Even ordinary monsters here have tough skins, so the main beast of this area is not even worth thinking about. A man with a bandage on his head whose name was Iber said that this was nonsense and it was immediately clear that this was what the slaves were saying. So his assistant turned to him and said that now is the time for me to do this, they need a solution. Elpum raised his hand and said that he needed 50,000 masses from each. Iber looked at our hero in bewilderment and asked what he was talking about. Our hero said that there are only 30 people here, so in total they need to pay one and a half million, and then they will act as bait so that the others can move on. Everyone fell silent. They were deceived by this decision and did not understand why this person was saying such things. Debo began to panic. He thought that the boss had gone completely crazy. Did he really want to kill them? Iber shouted that our hero should not interfere. It seems that his slave mentality has not yet completely disappeared. And let him not think that everything will be as he wants. In this situation the bait will not save them. If the useless bait dies immediately, then it will all be over for them. In the high-level gates the slaves are only in the way. Then he said who the hell are they to say such ideas. He pointed his finger at Debo and said that this idiot hasn't even woken up yet. What can a second circle man and a slave do? Debo was starting to get very angry. She was thinking that he didn't even have the thought of stopping the bait. Why does he keep running into trouble? Elpum, as always, in a calm voice, asked what Iber was offering then. But his interlocutor simply remained silent. He didn't have any idea. Elpum said that means he didn't have one. 
otherwise why would he collect it here? Alpam said that he missed something else. Their team has one person with the second circle, and one with the first circle. Then Debo looked at his hand and noticed that he really had the first circle. I didn't even notice the moment when this circle appeared. Now it has talent. Our hero also continued talking and said that we were his interlocutors. After all, only a couple of people with a second circle. The girl who listened to all this and asked our hero to wait. She was ready to pay money if he became bait, although she now does not have hundreds of thousands for the two of them. Alpam said that in this case she will already pay when they leave here. If they cannot escape, then in this case they will simply sacrifice themselves. But his condition is the consent of absolutely everyone. Now there was a tense situation. They needed to decide what they would do next. Still, they decided something. Near the gate from where they could finally get out there was that same terrible creature that ate those poor fellows that they managed to catch. But someone interrupted his meal. The creature felt someone's gaze on him. Having looked around, this creature saw that it was coming straight towards him, which our hero had released. This fire arrow hit this creature right in the face. The huge mushroom was surprised. His assistant tied the mouths of the Alps with bandages. Our hero told Debo to run only if the mushroom discovered them. Debo didn't understand why he was being punished for all this, but he couldn't refuse. As soon as the mushroom looked around and noticed where those violators of his peace were, he immediately rushed at them. Debo and our hero began to quickly run away. Debo did not understand why this mushroom was so fast. But he really was incredibly fast. He moved like a damn demon. The girl, along with the other team, said that now they must activate the gate before the bait is killed. And now the guys approached the gate and quickly clicked on it to activate it. The gate opened and the guys began to quickly run away trying to save their lives. And they succeeded. A huge creature pursued our heroes who quickly ran away from it. The mushroom roared and right in front of the guys many other creatures appeared that were less dangerous. But there were too many of them. Debo was very angry that something had happened, but he was not going to give up so easily. He swung his weapon and fought with those creatures to clear the way. And this time, he even unexpectedly activated a cutting explosion. Well, the ferocious creature in the shape of a mushroom was already overtaking him. Another moment, and he was dead. But fortunately, Alpam used a fiery arrow and knocked that creature down. On the teeth of this creature there was still fresh blood of the victims he had already devoured. Alpam used a fire arrow again as soon as he saw that mushroom rise to his head. This time, this mushroom realized its mistake and dodged the attack. Alpam immediately used his ring and turned the arrow in a different direction. But that mushroom was very fast. He dodged the attack in every possible way and screamed loudly. Alpam uses an arrow to hit him on the mushroom constantly dodging and approaching the guys. Debo shouted that he was approaching, then they ran to the edge of the cliff and jumped off from there. The mushroom tried to catch them but did not have time to do so this time. While they were falling, Debo began to tease this monster and showed him the middle finger. Elpa, meanwhile, used his fire arrow to attack the enemy and hit him. Then they fell straight into the water. It was a fast-moving river that moved very quickly. After some time, the guys managed to get to the shore and climb out onto land. Debo was breathing heavily and talking about how they almost died because of this damn toadstool. Elpam rose to his feet and began to wring out his wet clothes. Debo looked at his boss and asked him what he was doing. Elpam replied that he himself heard that this is the main monster. In order to kill him, preparation is needed. The power of our hero looked at his boss with a surprised look. He turned to his respected people and said that his words sounded as if they would hunt this monster. Or did he misunderstand him? Elpam replied that Debo understood everything correctly. Then the assistant asked is the boss kidding me? Elpam asked why he was shouting. Aren't they coming to hunt monsters? Debo replied that then he didn't know that the flu was so dangerous. And then he asked the boss if he knew anything about a tactical retreat. Elpam said that if they leave the gate then they won't be able to come back here. Debo shouted that he knows it. Debo he thought about the fact that they are no longer bait. Doesn't that mean it's time for them to get out of here? He thought about how Elpam is even going to win if his arrows are useless. Is this really such a strange way of committing suicide? Elpam said that the situation has changed. Their competitors have left. They have also earned money. Isn't that great? Our hero asked his assistant if he was right, and then said does he really want to terminate their contract? Debo fell silent and said that that's not what he meant. It's not about making more money, right? Elpam smiled and said that's exactly how it is. They need more money. 
Debo asked the boss if he could explain to him how they would kill the toadstool if any and it's useless. Fighting with him is like dooming yourself to death. But he must have a plan. The boss has a plan, right? Elpham looked at his assistant with a calm gaze as always and said that there was a way to win. And now let's go back a little. To the time when the guys jumped into the portal. They quickly ran out of the portal. The boss was already waiting for them. Who was surprised that they had already left. Isn't it too fast for a gate for forty people? A man with a cigar turned to a girl named Joubert and said that not everyone came out. She told him that the hunt had failed. Dolan's team and Elpham and his partner were still inside. They were able to escape only because they became bait. And she also said that they would never have defeated the boss on their own. The man with a cigar in his mouth looked at her in surprise and asked what she was even talking about. Did they really just run away? Joubert replied that the boss was a poisonous toadstool known for its cruelty. What could they do? Then the man threw away his cigar and turned around and was just going to leave. But the girl turned to him and said that the wind in that portal is still Elpham. The gate is still activated, which means he is alive. And her interlocutor said that it would not last long. After all, she herself said that it was a poisonous toadstool. So he said they could wait if they wanted, but he had things to do, and he just left. At the same time, that man thought that these were just useless idiots. The situation was not encouraging. A person with the second circle will never be able to buy a toadstool, so their outcome is a foregone conclusion. He doesn't need anyone who can run away. Now let's go back to another world. The toadstool returned back to the forest. The sun was already setting. Elpham stood on the edge of the cliff and aimed a fiery arrow somewhere. Elpham seemed to hear the thoughts of the man who finances him. He thought that he wanted someone who could accomplish the impossible. Elpham concentrated and then said that they were starting the hunt and released his arrow. The arrow quickly began to fly, enveloping everything around in fire. And compared to other bosses, this one is very strong. The matter is complicated by the fact that poisonous fumes emanate from it. All that remains is to maintain a distance and put pressure. With the current level of fire arrow, this will be problematic. And if you use telekinesis and rotate the arrow at high speed, the penetrating ability will increase. Essentially, the arrow turns into a bullet. In the world of maple, only Elpham can use this method, which allows him to accomplish the impossible. This method was called a revolver. The untwisted arrow rushed straight to the head of the toadstool, and then the toadstool received damage. The creature screamed loudly. The arrow went through like a bullet piercing the flesh of a terrible monster. Elpham, as always, was focused and confident in what he was doing. It was the arrow that picked up speed from above so that it even crushed the trees in its path. Elpham wanted to immediately drink the head of the creator, and at the same time the core, he missed us a little. This creature even began to anger him. The enraged monster, bleeding purple blood, roared loudly. Then the terrible creature rushed forward and began to hit directly towards this place from where the arrows were flying. Elpham continued to shoot, but the creature could dodge when it saw where it was being attacked from. Using a revolver does not allow you to easily control the direction of the arrow, and I also have problems with the reload time of the skill. But you still need to put an end to the toadstool before it takes advantage of its recovery. The toadstool was getting closer and closer to its enemy. Debo stood behind a tree and waited in the wings. The ferocious creature was very close to him. This terrible mushroom screamed loudly. Elpham shouted to his partner that now is the time. Debo quickly left the rope and pulled it between the trees. The pale grebe tripped over this rope at high speed and began to fall. The creature fell into the swamp and then began to quickly rise there. The ferocious creature froze for several seconds, trying to understand what had happened. Elpham just stood and waited. He was the bait while his assistant had to do the rest of the work. Mushroom screamed very loudly, wounded and humiliated, but he felt that something was wrong here. That Suddenly, from behind the trees on Debo's rope, I threw my axe straight at the creature's head. It hit exactly where it needed to. It hit the head. And then he pulled himself up by the rope to return his weapon back to himself. And in less than a second the axe was in his hand. The bloody creature began to emit poisonous gas. Debo was serious about the fight. He beckoned the creature with his finger and asked if his opponent was ready to dance a bloody tango. He stood in front of the bloody mushroom with his weapon in his hand. Alpam at this moment I thought about whether they did everything necessary. The basis of this strategy was to lure him into the swamp, because the most important thing in hunting is to deprive the prey of its strengths. And now this freak has lost his most powerful weapon. Debo was already ready to pounce on his opponent, 
the pores of this mushroom were clogged with dirt. Debo still fought him from a distance. He again swung his weapon, which was tied to a rope, and again he hit his opponent in the head. He controlled this weapon as if he was born with it. The flu felt pain. He was injured. It was difficult for him to move, and he could not fully release gas. Debo began to attack him with a series of blows. The mushroom screamed loudly and tried to cover its head with its huge paws. At some point, this creature managed to repel the attack of its opponent. Toad still tried to run but he couldn't. Alpum brought the monster into the swamp not only to prevent it from spreading poison. The verdict was that a dense swamp makes life very difficult for someone who relies on speed. Alpum again used a fire arrow called a revolver. The mushroom could not move. It was difficult for him to move due to the fact that his legs were in the swamp. The creature tried to cover itself from the attack with its own hands, but the revolver was stronger. He shouted loudly. Debo watched what was happening and was ready to counterattack. At some point he even thought that this was the end. Did they really kill the monster? Well, as it turned out, everything was not so simple. The smoke cleared and again our heroes saw the outlines of a monster standing on its feet. Elpum shouted to his partner to hit him on the body first. His core should be in the head. Debo shouted that he knew it and immediately swung his weapon. And so he again almost hit his enemy's head with his weapon. But something happened that he did not expect. The angry mushroom, which looked like a demon from the worst nightmares, grabbed the axe with its own hand. Debo didn't expect this at all. He just froze in place from such a surprise. Toadstool sharply pulled the rope and Debo, who was tightly holding this rope, began to fly straight towards the enemy. Elpum, as always, without panic, used the ring to help his partner. There was a log lying nearby. Our hero grabbed this log and threw it straight into the toadstool. Debo grabbed a branch from this log right in the air. The toadstool threw the log away, managing to react. But in the meantime his legs sank deeper and deeper into the swamp. Alpum managed to dodge and he ended up behind the toadstool. It was an advantageous position. With a turn, he hit the toadstool on the head with his foot. In surprise, the toadstool screamed even louder. Debo managed to jump back and landed on a dead tree that was lying in this swamp. Then he pulled the weapon towards him and aimed again at the enemy. He quickly jumped off that piece of wood and began to quickly run along the stones that protruded from the swamp. Alpum again used the power of his ring to disorient his opponent. As it turned out, our hero even knows how to control water with the help of this ring. He created a trap around this creature. She attacked him with streams of water in order to divert attention from her assistant. While the mushroom was distracted, Debo appeared from some direction. Toad still managed to react and tried to grab his victim. But when he approached Debo with his paw, there was no one there. Debo quickly got behind his opponent and swung his axe to chop off his head. And finally, exactly what they had been trying to achieve for so long happened, their heads flew uphill. Then the head of this creature simply fell into the swamp, while the body still stood straight. Debo began to breathe heavily. Elpum looked at him from that cliff. Debo panted and looked at his boss and gave him a thumbs up. Elpum already thought that it was all over. She suddenly saw something he didn't expect. A headless monster suddenly appeared behind his assistant. Debo also thought that everything was in order and relaxed a little. It was his mistake because the creature, even without a head, hit him hard in the head. With such a blow, he quickly fell into the swamp. His weapon flew out of his hands. The headless creature screamed in a new way using its respiratory tract. Elpum did not understand what was the matter. They had cut off his head. Again I fired an arrow directly at this creature to finally finish it off completely. Having released the arrow, he waited until the smoke cleared to see what happened there. But that creature was no longer in place. It moved quickly as if it had a head. Elpum understood that something was wrong here. He saw this creature approaching and began to use his ring. Trying to save his assistant, Elpum wanted to throw this creature away. But it jumped from the deck that our hero lifted into the air. The creature clung to the rock and began to climb up the slope. Elpum understood that he had the last arrow left. After it he would not be able to wait for reloading. It was also pointless to shoot anywhere. Debo, his head bleeding, began to rise to his feet. He was incredibly angry. This creature was already really annoying him, and he was ready to fight the mushroom hand to hand. With all his strength and anger, he threw his weapon straight towards the enemy using an explosive flash. With such a powerful throw, he simply cut this creature into two halves. Now the creature could not resist and began to fall down. Debo watched with a smile as pieces of his opponent fell. 
We suddenly noticed that the upper part of this creature was still moving, and it seemed even easier for him to climb the mountain. Debo screamed. For the boss to be careful, Elpum took aim to finally kill this creature, but this time he missed, because the terrible creature could still evade. It turns out that his head was actually where everyone thought it was, it was just his mouth. The real head was hidden in the chest area, and red eyes sparkled from there. Elpum thanked the creature for showing him its head. Now Debo noticed that Elpum was holding a signal pistol, which means that the shot was a bluff. Our hero's staff caught fire, and he used the next shot called a revolver, and hit the creature right in the head. The arrow, even at this moment, had difficulty but was still able to pass through the toadstools. And finally, as it seemed to everyone, it was destroyed by this last shot. Elpum watched as there was a strong explosion at the place where the creature fell. And then the unexpected happened. A cloud of gas flew into the air. Debo looked at it and realized that this toadstool was a pain in the ass until the very end. Elpum grabbed her partner with a rope in order to take him away from that wave. He took him up the mountain towards him. Debo sighed with relief and then said that he already thought that he would die. And down there it was very dangerous. Everything was shrouded in caustic poison. Our hero's partner asked if they had already finished this battle. Elpum replied in a calm voice that everything was finished, and he also praised his partner for a good job. Elpum said that they would take the core as soon as the poison was blown away by the wind, but suddenly the unexpected happened. The upper part of the toadstool, which no longer had a head and which emitted only poisonous smoke, flew into the air. The guys saw inside that creature a core that they needed to take away. The creature was still dangerous. It exuded acrid smoke. It was almost lifeless, but it was going to kill those who attacked it. Debo inhaled this caustic poison and immediately fell under its influence and began to laugh. Now let's move to another place there too. One man laughed loudly, turning to his interlocutor and asking, is this really why he returned? It was the same head of this organization who told the man with the eye patch that he was still just as mischievous. The man with the eye patch asked for forgiveness and said that he thought it would be best to hand the matter over to the Swan Knights. Someone knocked on the door. The man with the bandage immediately shouted that he had already said that they would have a meeting, so let them go away. But apparently they weren't going to listen to him. Someone's voice came from the other side of the door and said that he was coming in. At first, the man with an eye patch looked in surprise at who dared to come here, and then he was even more surprised when he saw who it was. He saw our hero in front of him who was all exhausted and in tattered clothes, he said that he had returned. When the head saw him, a wide devilish smile appeared on his face. He looked at our hero and said that this was very interesting. He turned to Abiz and asked what this was all about. Had someone returned from the dead? Rack and what else turned to our hero with a smile and said that he was pleased to meet him and said his name. And he also said that he knew about our hero and knew his name. And besides, he justified the rumors about his ability to survive. After all, just now they are needed. Elpum bowed and said thank you. Rackin said that's great. He's also polite, and he wants to ask one question. Will he be able to show his skills again in a 100-man gate? The exhausted Elpum remained silent at first. He looked at his interlocutor with a calm gaze. Then he closed his eyes and said that it would still be difficult. Rackin stopped smiling and looked at our hero, thinking about something. ABI screamed. How dare he talk to Sir Rackin like that? Does he really think that he appointed his adventurers so that he could choose the tasks for himself? He should not forget his duty. Rackin smiled again and said that if it was difficult then it would be possible. He then said that he doesn't like to beat around the bush. So he'll ask another question. He directly asked our hero what does he really want. After these events, Elpum and Debo were sitting at the bar and Debo was drinking beer. But when his boss told him one interesting thing, he immediately spat out the beer out of surprise. He asked will it really be five million per person, that is, for the two of them it will be ten million. This is too much. Elpum looked at his interlocutor with a dissatisfied look because he had just spat out beer on him. Debo asked for forgiveness, and then said that there was no need to act out like that, and they would definitely refuse. It was the first time in a long time that they were taking on a difficult task. Elpum, wiping his face, said that these were not his problems they would solve them themselves. Debo said that his boss is acting as if nothing had happened after making such a fuss. If they fail, Edbees will take them to the black book. And finally old friends approached them. One man said that they looked very relaxed. It was the same man with the red bandage on his head. 
he said that they felt like they were dying. Debo got angry and got up from the table. He asked if he really thanks his saviors like that. He also said that he didn't like him right away and let him follow him. They should forget about ranks and have a good fight. But suddenly that man and the girl who stood nearby bowed their heads before our heroes and asked for their forgiveness. The man with the red headband said that they judged them fairly and doubted their abilities. Now he is ashamed that he is such an adventurer and he wants to apologize from the bottom of his heart. Then he extended his hand in which was a bag with one and a half million masses, and besides, he reported some money on his own to thank them. Dubois was very surprised by this behavior of this man. He thanked him out of surprise. Elpham, finishing his beer, said that they agreed on 1.5 million, they didn't need the rest. And besides, he just did the job he signed up for, let them take back their gratitude. Elpham looked at those guys and said that he wanted them not to misunderstand them. The man and girl who came here looked at our hero in surprise. Debo realized that he had been happy very early and in vain. Now he would have to recalculate everything. Elpham turned to the man with the red bandage on his head and said that he must be a pirate. And besides, his name is Iburu? Our hero asked what about him. Can he do the job he was paid for? The next event unfolds in a different place. Now a man with a black patch over his eye says that they cannot do this. He stood in front of his boss and said that they couldn't give them ten million masses, the kind of sums that adventurers with three or four rings receive. He was certainly the best candidate for this job, but if they agreed to his terms, they would set a bad precedent. Perhaps he really was just testing how far he could go. It would be better to call him again and renegotiate the amount. But the head looked at him and asked does he really think so? In fact, it wouldn't be strange if he asked for twice as much. The man with the black eye patch asked what his boss meant. Meanwhile, the boss handed him a piece of paper with something written on it, and he told his interlocutor to read it. This time, they will only send a detachment to the Alps from their Gaper trading guild. The man with the green one asked what just two people could do. He asked his boss if he was really serious about this. The boss replied that he could have problems. If it weren't true, he bought this information for a lot of money. There was information about a dark lord named Jean. A man with a black patch over his eye was very worried. The boss put his pen on the table and told the bees not to forget. The war has already begun. The following events take place near the next portal, near which a lot of people have already gathered. Those people set up a camp there and were talking animatedly about something, wondering what would happen next. And then those guys noticed that our heroes came to them. They were talking about something among themselves. Elpham turned to his assistant and told him not to fly in the clouds. He should concentrate. Dubois replied that there was no need to worry. He was now an experienced adventurer. Now our hero's clothes were the same badge from the guild in which he was registered. And as often happens, the guys who were here before our heroes for some reason disliked them. Debo, looking around, said that the atmosphere here is certainly not super pleasant. And as always, there is someone who decides to talk to them. He began the conversation with the fact that they really have new faces here. Are they from the Gaper Guild? He said that he was pleased to meet you. Then this man with long hair said that he was either from the Genius Guild. His name was Shudin. Elpham said his name and said that he was rank C. Then his interlocutor was very surprised, because he thought that only people with one or two circles could enter here. Therefore, he was very surprised that our hero was of rank C. He did not understand why this was so. They were approached by a woman who said that she would like to talk to Elpham. She said that she had an affair with this man. He was a rather pretty and slender woman. Then Shudin turned around and started to leave. He realized that this person must be with them. He just wasted his time. The next turn of events takes us to another place where our hero asks his so-called boss why he has to do this. Ebi said that he should just do what he is told. Why so many questions? Their trade guild, Gaper, will work together with the Order of the Knights of Cygnus. They follow the teachings of Emperor Cygnus and are the strongest squad. Those who are called the symbol of power became interested in these gates. Who are you at these gates were already occupied by other guilds, so they decided to unite with them, even though these knights are still learning their craft, but with them they will have more chances. He also said that although they may have other motives for completing this dungeon, they made them a good offer. Elpham said that he understood everything, there is nothing complicated and you just need to work together. Ebbies said that he simply wouldn't, he felt like there was something wrong with them. The blonde woman said that her name was Kiri. She was in charge of the rookie squad of their order, and she hoped that they would not think that they were of the same status just because they exchanged a few words. 
Dibwa, when he heard that woman said that she didn't need personal problems, so let them listen to her orders and silently carry them out. Dibwa asked what kind of relationship she had. An arrogant woman asked, Are there really only the two of them from the Gaper Guild? Elpum replied that everything seemed to be so. Then the woman lowered her head and said that it seemed impossible. Gaper finally gave up. While they weren't talking, another guild, Dig, approached them. It was Crocus's squad. There was also a trade guild called Merdia. This was Cubula's detachment. Debo was surprised that the elites of respected guilds had gathered here. Now the situation has changed. But most of all they were surprised when they saw some women. It was this same trading guild called Goldrich, Natasha's three sisters. The blonde woman who talked to our hero said that those red-haired women behave very arrogantly. And finally, the red-haired man in armor said that everything was assembled. He greeted them all and said that they were chosen as guards for this raid. His name is Lanko. They will cover them while they leave the gate. He also said that he knows what they have already been told but he still needs to go over the details. The legendary items that come across in these gates will not belong to them even if they got them. The rights to the items remain with their guilds. They will be paid the amount they agreed to. But they should be glad that they were at least allowed to keep the magic stones. And if they are caught while they are trying to steal an item, then the following will happen to them. Such people will have to face their B-rank squad. And everyone should remember this. When this man raised his hand, Debo noticed that this red-haired man had five circles. What surprised him even more was that it looked like they were all like this. They must be very powerful. Then that man said that that was all for him. I couldn't go inside. A blonde woman in armor turned to our hero and told them to follow them, because they would go forward. Before entering the portal, she looked forward with concentration and said that victory would be theirs. And then she quickly walked forward. Debo asked her boss in surprise what was wrong with her. Do they really need to work with someone like her? But our hero thought that finally what he needed had happened. He worked on himself precisely for this gate. He was in this gate even in a past life. But he must prevail. He thought that this was where everything would begin. Elpum told Debo to follow him. But his assistant said that he would not help them even if the tears started to flow. They entered the gate and were immediately transported to a completely different world. They appeared in some field and followed forward. There was even some kind of path there. The thickets here were very tall. Dibwa asked his boss if he knew anything about this world. Why is the grass so tall here? The woman in armor asked if he thought they came here to admire nature, let him move faster, and keep up with them. Dibwa looked at her again angrily and turned to his boss, asking are they really going to put up with this? When he looked at boss, he saw that he was behaving somehow strangely. Elpum put his head to the ground and seemed to be listening to something. Dibwa asked what the boss was doing, but he already knew what he was doing. He felt vibrations in the ground, and not far from them a lot of dust appeared. And finally, when they looked around, they realized that a tape pig was approaching them. There were a lot of them and they arrived very quickly. The guys realized that there were at least one thousand of them here. The woman in armor shouted that they should not stand rooted to the spot. They should split up. Not everyone has entered the portal yet. Then the other guys also tensed up. These are the rules. You can't attract enemies into the dungeon. The El Nido trade guild began to quickly run away in the other direction. Someone approached them saying that they should run in a different direction. But they said that they would run exactly in the direction they themselves had determined. Fierce pigs quickly jumped out of the dense thickets and rushed at the people. First of all, they ran after the knights. Then the head of the knights said that this was great. They would lead them to an area where there would be more obstacles and kill everyone there. One of the members of her guild turned to Lady Kiri and said that they had a problem people from the Gaper Guild had disappeared. There was a light wind at the hem, and in the meantime our heroes were away from those pigs. Dibwa said that this wind was very refreshing. He turned to the boss and said that now he could relax. But how did he understand that the tape pigs would attack them? Elpum said that from his own experience he can say that such terrain usually looks like a herd of animals. The average length of tape pigs is 2m. They are very aggressive, they usually move in groups that consist of hundreds or even thousands of individuals. Elpum was confused about the fact that they are a tough opponent, but they can be killed. Most likely other guilds also think so. It's just that our hero thinks that they will try to avoid battle immediately upon entering the gate in order to save their strength. And since no one knows who they will stumble upon here, it is unlikely that everything will end with just pigs. Elpum thought that no one had returned from this ride before he returned. Debo you noticed that the boss was somehow suspiciously silent, 
and asked him what was he thinking about. While he was looking at his boss, he did not notice that a rope appeared under his foot, and he tripped over it with his foot. As soon as the rope tightened, the trap immediately went off. Many huge sharp stakes almost killed Debo. Elpham quickly pulled him away. Debo was very scared when he almost fell into this trap. Where did she come from? Debo even panicked for a moment because he almost died such a stupid death. Who put her here? The following events take place in a slightly different place. But in the same world, someone cut the rope and a huge wooden block began to fly straight at him. But this bald man managed to react and quickly cut that log into two parts. Then he looked at his assistants and said that this was some kind of childishness. One of his assistants said that he had already finished clearing this place, and it seemed like they had already done everything. The masked man turned to the man with the scar on his head and told him not to let his guard down. This was a distinctive feature of this guild. Their leader wore a white mask. He thought that they stopped some small traps, but they should be enough to kill on the spot. Moreover, they copied the principles of hunting people. From this alone one can say that these monsters are unusual. It looks like they have a very developed intelligence. These are local goblins. It will be more difficult to deal with them. They are equal to the boss from the Red Gate. The man with a white mask on his head said that now they know what to expect. But this place definitely has a high difficulty. Everyone would have died already if it weren't for an adventurer of his level with them. Then he turned around and began to walk forward, saying that he needed to turn this state of affairs in his favor. First he said that we need to follow him. And then he said that we need to make sure that they didn't leave anything behind. When he looked around, he noticed that his interlocutor's head had been blown off. And then the other guys who were in his guild also had their heads cut off instantly. The last thing his flying head thought was what was going on here. That man's head fell to the ground. But as we know, after death, the head can think for about five more seconds. The last thing that man's head heard was that the thug said that they were stupid and acted like they knew everything. Not far from that place. A man sat in the thick grass and thought that he didn't know who came up with the idea of using pigs. He sat on a stone and spoke in order to distract the people who had just entered the gate. But it worked. Now it's time for him to get down to business. It was some kind of magician. He sat and thought about something and then said that things were bad. Behind him stood three girls with red hair. The man said that there was nothing to be done. They didn't have much time. And then he said that they needed to start. The girls stood and were silent, they did not move. Well, suddenly one of them moved her hand. That strange man with a staff turned to the girl and said that even if he didn't try to move, he had such magic. They should wait at least another thirty minutes, the red-haired girl asked him why he was doing this. Then that man with the staff looked at her in surprise and said that she was incredible, she was able to speak under his spell, which was to be expected from Natasha. He then said that she looked dangerous so he would immediately get rid of her and at the same time immediately hit her in the stomach with his staff. The other two girls, who were also in a daze and could not move, were very tense at that moment. And then a strange man sat down and said that this question is very difficult to answer. Why is he doing all this? Then he jumped to his feet and his staff caught fire. He said that it would be clearer if he spoke. He was already about to kill the girls and said that all this was for the sake of the black magician. But suddenly the girls noticed that fire arrow was approaching them. This fire arrow was fired by the same magician who was holding the staff. Today there was a shot. He killed the girls, blood splashed in different directions. This killer calmly said that there was no end to them, but not far from him the portal was still burning. In reality, he just wanted to play the fool, he was not interested in all those legendary items. Now we find out that this eccentric's name was William. He was addressed by the same high-ranking man who looked like some kind of vampire. He told him that they had been waiting for a very long time and kept their heads down, and all this for the sake of this moment. They were hiding and growing, increasing their strength. And now the time has come to reap the fruits of your efforts. The man with green hair said in a calm voice that he would not let his boss down. Then the white-haired man took a fiery feather and told his interlocutor to take it. That man gave it to him and he said that he would not accept failure. Then the man put this first thing on as a pendant and thought that after this he could not shirk. He talked to himself and said that there was no other way out. All that remained was to take the matter seriously. After some time, evening came and our heroes approached some settlement. But it was an unusual settlement, and those same goblins and orcs lived there. There were quite a lot of them there. They were all armed and were busy strengthening their estate. 
Debo looked very surprised at everything that was happening here. He could not believe his eyes. He asked his boss who else they were and why they were all green. He had never seen anything like that before. They all look like they are bosses. Alpam said that he already said that there is only one leader among them. The problem is not only their number, but also that they are strong and have a lot of health. And judging by the fact that they take the adventurer's items, it will be even more difficult to resist them. Some of them can also use skills. Debo was already starting to panic. He asked his voice what the hell is going on here. Because they are all like a crowd of adventurers, can the two of them really deal with these monsters? Alpam said that his partner is damn right, and he grasps everything quickly on the fly. Dibois continued in a panic to ask what this I mean. He says that they cannot be defeated. You just need to go back and join Kiki, Kiri, or whatever her name is. Alpam asked what was the matter. Didn't Debo want to get rid of them? Debo replied that he didn't know then that they would meet such monsters and he wasn't going to attack them together. Well, what can Debo do in such a situation? He can't help but listen to his boss. Meanwhile, the green creatures, armed, went about their business. One of those orcs sensed some movement happening behind him and looked around. It was Debo who tried to chop the big green guy with his axe, but he managed to dodge. Debo, he shouted angrily, is he really doing this on purpose? He didn't mean that he would go at them alone when he said that they wouldn't go into battle together. The orc's eyes glowed brightly, and he began to try to hit his opponent. Debo also managed to dodge his attacks, and then jumped quite high right above the enemy's head. He quickly jumped over it, and did not fall under the attack. Then the two of these creatures attacked Debo. A deadly fight ensued. Debo tried in every possible way to evade. Although the creatures were huge, they were very fast. After a few dodges, Debo finally began to strike with his weapon, and he managed to hit that orc's head. After we hit we in the head, he immediately swung his axe and cut his leg. The ferocious creature fell to the ground very loudly. This orc began to scream loudly. While he was wounded, Debo immediately approached the orc to deal lethal damage. But that orc was a little faster than the first one, and he quickly dodged and did not fall under the attack. When Debo looked at the enemy, he saw that he was already preparing for a powerful attack. This time Debo did not have time to react and he received a powerful blow right in the face. From such a powerful blow, he flew straight into a tree and hit another one. Blood immediately began to flow from his face, but he was almost okay and said that with these creatures, not everything is so simple. The orc immediately began to attack the guy further and wanted to kill him. Finally, Debo managed to bend down and the muscular green creature simply cut down the tree that came under attack. Debo took advantage of the moment, and managed to cut off the creature's hand. But the orc immediately grabbed Debo by the face and threw him very hard on the ground. He wanted to hit him like this several times, but Debo managed to twist the orc's arm and free himself. The orc pulled his hand back and Debo quickly jumped away from his opponent. But at that same moment, he immediately jumped straight at the enemy and his weapon caught fire in his hands. Debo was very serious at that moment, and he managed to defeat his opponents but not alone. Debo tried to shake off the dirt, and said that he no longer hoped that Elpam would help him. Elpam said that his partner did a great job himself. Now he will be more confident against them. Debo said that he only doubts even more now. If they meet a huge crowd of such monsters, then he will definitely not be able to defeat them. But suddenly, walking through this forest, they noticed the bloody bodies of headless people. These were the Singas knights. But who killed them and what even happened here? One of them was still alive. He was bleeding and Debo immediately drew attention to him. It was a survivor who was seriously injured, and he was breathing very heavily. Elpam approached him and said what happened here, and were they really attacked by goblins? That man in armor said that it was nothing like that. It was trolling. Meanwhile, a man with a cigar in his hand was sitting in his office and thinking about something. He slowly smoked a cigar and thought that this was some kind of nonsense. And now we should find out what trolling is. There are people who attack adventurers. Taking advantage of the fact that no one knows what is happening inside the gate. This means that the gate is an ideal place for a crime, since all evidence will disappear after it is closed. Well, in this case, these are competitions without winners. Now the people inside must confront our opponents strongly with fewer people on their side. And even if one of them manages to pull off their job and bring out unique items, suspicions will still fall on them. The man with the cigar was thinking about the fact that they did this in order to destroy the best warriors of other trade guilds, 
such a reason is not very convincing. Even if this is so, they risk starting a war with everyone else. The guilds did not seriously think about such risky operations, but maybe is someone else responsible for this? Debo turned to the boss and said that this simply could not happen. Elpham said that he did not see this woman here. Then the wounded warrior hit the ground with his fist. Bleeding, he fell to his knees and said that it was his fault. There was an enemy among them. Why did Lady Kiri do this? Elpham said that he does not understand why she would troll if she has membership in the Knights of Cygnus. The wounded man said that it was difficult to believe that this was true. But now he understands why she gave him the order when they entered the gate. Before it was all over, Lady Kiri herself said so. She directly said that she was a follower of the Black Magician. Debo, as always, was surprised by everything, and our hero stood calmly and simply thought about the situation. As one of the superiors, the Black Magician along with countless followers threatened the Maple World 800 years ago. A superior is a powerful being who can control the three fundamental laws of the universe, light, life and time. In the case of the Black Magician he was a former superior of light. Six heroes remained to stop him, and when the Black Mage and the six heroes entered the battle, the situation changed. The Allied forces launched a counterattack against the followers, and in their ranks, which led to the destruction of the followers of the Black Magician. All the inhabitants of the world of Maple know about this. Debo said that you cannot be that she is consistently a black mage. Elpham said that they are similar, and that this time they will not be able to hunt monsters. The first thing they need to do is find that woman. Elpham asked that wounded man if he would go with them. He had better be prepared for battle by the time they found her. The wounded man, who was bleeding from his mouth, said that this is exactly what he wants. Meanwhile, there, a pretty lady named Lady Kiri was running quickly among the thick grass. Suddenly she discovered in front of her on the way that same magician with the staff who turned to her and said that he was waiting for her. Next to him was another hooded thug who stood next to that man. The cross-eyed magician said that it was she who was responsible for the ribbon pigs. Thanks to the fact that they were all separated, it was easier for them to stick to the plan. And now they had almost reached the final stage, and then he asked her how she would like their gift. Kiri drew her sword and turned to those people asking who they were. Meanwhile, our heroes helped the wounded man move. Debo said that they could go slower if he was in pain. The boss still went forward, but his interlocutor replied that he was fine and thanked Debo. Our hero's partner said that there is no need to worry. The boss knows how to find what he needs. They will be there soon. He said that this was good. What a relief. And behind his back he held an enchanted blade that was already ready to be used in battle. At the same time, the sound of steel and other metal could be heard elsewhere. Kiri fought with that thug, and besides, he was not alone. The magician watched this and said that it was impressive, which was to be expected from the head of novice knights. Well, who knows how long this will last. Lady Kiri was not going to give up. She cast a spell called Rising Sun, and her blade lit up with a bright light. She was attacked by a woman with black hair who asked her why she stood up. Kiri accelerated and began to attack her opponent with lightning speed and a moment later she simply cut it into several pieces. It was a sunstroke. Kiri was breathing heavily after such attacks, but she said that if they don't want to die, then let them say what they are planning. The green-eyed magician said that she was very noisy, and what were they doing anyway? Let them finish her off now. The thugs immediately rushed at the girl to kill her instantly. Someone who helped her jumped out. He simply cut everyone into pieces very quickly. The magician and Kiri were very surprised after they saw who intervened in the battle. It was Debo who carefully looked around to see if there was any other danger. Now let's take a little trip back to the forest where Debo was helping that blonde man. That very moment when that fair-haired man grabbed his blade and was already trying to stab Debo. He said that he should give his honors to Kiri when he meets her. But he did not have time to complete his evil deed because Elpham intervened and shot off his hand with the blade. He screamed loudly in pain and fell to the ground. Debo was again surprised that this man wanted to kill him. Elpham shot off his hand with his staff and the man screamed loudly in pain. Debo looked at the boss in bewilderment and asked him what was that just now. Elpham was unhappy with what happened. He said that they never exceed his expectations. Elpham gave him a chance to survive and he decided to do it this way. Then the blonde man in armor said that he wanted to ask him for forgiveness. Elpham lit his staff and said that he still doesn't trust people. Thus, Debo was saved, and now we will return back to the place where they met the magician.
this green-eyed man said that he did not think that they would have uninvited guests. The assistants turned to Sir William and said that this man was from the Gaper Guild. Then the magician said that this coward Pitten must not even have been able to kill himself, and he failed again, and this after the magician gave him another chance. And despite the fact that he missed Lady Curie, it seems that they were just wasting their compassion on him. Well, bad luck, these two look pretty strong, so we'll have to take advantage. The magician said that he would have to use their elite, and that we could find our old acquaintances. Curie shouted to Debo to be careful, these bastards are very strong. Debo said that he knows everything himself. They are just perverts, the girl asked what he means. William shouted for them to go wild here. Those guys immediately rushed into battle. Debo asked Kiri if she could handle at least one, and he would take on the rest. She replied that she shouldn't underestimate her. Debo reacted to his opponent's ferocious blow and managed to dodge. Then he tried to cut off his opponent's head, but he also managed to react. Debo was confident in his abilities, he said that there was nothing special about it, right? The next blow came from where he did not expect. It was some woman with a crossbow who fired a piercing arrow. She had an unusual weapon. It was not a simple crossbow, but a magical one. Debo managed to react and dodge the arrow, thinking about what a secretive bitch she was. But because of this, he did not notice that an enemy with a sword approached behind him and then made a vertical attack and inflicted a wound on Debo's back. But the man with the axe fell to one knee. It turned out that this blow only scratched him. Then the enemy who inflicted this wound on him again rushed at Dibwe and told him not to worry. Soon he would be able to rest. He made a jumping attack, while Debo had already risen to both feet. Kiri noticed that Debo was in danger and wondered what he was doing. Well, as it turned out, Debo had already thought of everything. He sharply dodged and ended up behind his opponent. And then he answered Kiri's question, who asked what he was doing. Debo said that he was just playing along with his opponent. He cut it with a sharp movement of his axe, leaving no chance for the enemy. Immediately after him, a man with a spear ran up to Debo and wanted to pierce him. His attacks were almost lightning fast, but Debo managed to dodge. Returning several times, he struck his opponent with incredible force. There was another man in armor. He didn't understand where this guy got such strength. Suddenly, behind him, he heard something approaching him and the voice of Kiri who said that they were disappointing her. As it turned out, she hit her opponent, and the man in armor managed to dodge so that the opponent did not fall on him. Kiri asked do they really call themselves or this. It's just a shame. Those guys understood that they were losing here. They were furious with what happened here. The magician said that he could not allow this farce to continue any further. He decided to put an end to this, and said that they had already wasted their too precious hour on them. Debo knew this technique. He understood that this magician would now release a fiery arrow. A moment later, the arrow was already approaching Debo's head. He was very surprised that this arrow was much faster than his boss. Then an explosion occurred in the place where that fire arrow hit. The cross-eyed magician said that his opponent relaxed because he saw a familiar spell, his fire arrow at a completely new level. Well, even though he had seen something like this before, he still couldn't dodge. Now the magician said with relief that it seemed they were over. Now we need to move on to conquering the gates. But something happened that he did not expect. When the smoke cleared he saw that Debo was okay. There right in front of him stands Elpham, who defended his partner. Elpham looked into the eyes of that cross-eyed William. He was thinking about something. Meanwhile, William looked at his opponent with incredible surprise and asked who he was. Elpham raised his hand to the side and used his ring of levitation. He said that their guests would be coming soon, and as it turned out, he attracted those ferocious pigs here. The ferocious pigs began to trample in a crowd right on those guys who stood in their way. The tape pigs started attacking those guys and they tried to fight back. But William was quite powerful, he managed to defeat that huge creature that was approaching him. He thought that they were making his life very difficult. They ran away immediately after setting the pigs on them. William told those guys to follow him, but one of them apologized. And then he said that they had just finished with these creatures. William said that they don't have time to regroup, so they immediately set off in pursuit. William thought that if two of you leave the gate, they will definitely have problems. By the way, that guy is very unpleasant. He had some strange feeling. One of his assistants said that there were traces here. William said that it was good. If they were the first to stumble upon the man in the cloak, then just let him restrain him, and he would deal with him himself. 
but William's assistant said that he didn't have to fight him alone. If he allowed, this man didn't look like a weak bug. William said that there is no need to worry about it. Doesn't he know that in this gate there is no one stronger than William? Now our hero had two assistants who followed him. Debo as always, he tried to stay positive and asked his boss if he had seen their faces at the end. He was wondering if the monsters would trample those people. Elpam answered that they wouldn't just die, and you need to watch your step and not forget about the traps. Debo said that he remembers this, but why didn't the boss destroy them? He could just take advantage of the opportunity when they opened. Elpam answered something unexpected for Debo and said that he did not do this because they are stronger than Elpam. Our hero thought about the fiery arrow that that magician shot. At the moment when William shot his fiery arrow, Elpam did the same. He wanted to destroy the enemy's arrow, but it didn't work out as he planned. When our hero took a closer look, he saw that that arrow was still moving and it was unharmed. As it turned out, when our hero hit the enemy's arrow with his arrow, his arrow simply bounced off. His fire arrow only changed its own trajectory and had no effect on his arrow. Debo had never met anyone stronger than his boss. He laughed and said that these were just jokes. Elpam asked why his assistant thought he was joking. Debo asked did Elpam really just run away? Elpam replied that everything was correct, and then he began to remove the leather armor on his hands. Taking a closer look at the circles on his hand, he said that they seemed to have become as wide as possible. And when the circles become thicker, his abilities become faster and stronger. And since he is at the peak of the power of the two rings, they must be equal, or Elpam can win. But that person's magic is too strong, and since he entered this gate, it means he also has two rings, perhaps he somehow strengthened his abilities. Therefore, he is most likely the strongest strong adventurer here. Debo asked what they should do then. Maybe they should set goblins on them. Elpam said that not everything is so simple. Goblins are different from tape pigs. They can find out what their relationship is with them and use it against them. Debo asked the boss is all this true? Does he even understand what situation they are in now? Kiri said that what is important now is that the follower of the black mage was able to penetrate the ranks of the Cygnus knights. This is a problem on which the fate of the whole world will depend, and they need to leave now. She clutched her sword in her hand and told them to forget about conquering the gate. Elpam said that it didn't matter. Debois asked what his boss was talking about now. Kiri was very angry and said that this was to be expected from the former coffin. He still wants to get a small reward from this raid. Elpam I said that they should assume that she will be able to tell about what happened. But what will she do after that? Does she really think that she can get rid of them this way? Don't underestimate them. The followers of the black paper hid their identities for several generations and grew deep into the depths of several centuries. If they announce that they have returned, they will only begin to cover their tracks by digging deeper and deeper into the ground. If they begin to hide, it will be impossible to find them. They will only become poison that will poison the maple world where no one will see them. The girl got very angry and ran up to our hero and then grabbed him by the clothes and screamed that he was saying that this wouldn't work. Well then, what does he propose? And let him not dare to wag his tongue. He did not offer any plan. Now you the thugs are chasing them. They need to escape before they understand them. Elpam, as always, was calm and said that he would just need to show those guys something. He took Kiri's hand with his hand and said that he needed to show them which of them was really a hunter. Meanwhile, there was already a hunt for our heroes. They were trying to find them throughout the forest. The thugs held their weapons in their hands and quickly ran, looking for at least some traces. The man with red hair turned to his assistants and said that you should find them quickly. After all, if they run away, their own lives will be in danger. And suddenly Debo appeared behind that man. He smiled widely and aimed at his victim and then said did he miss them? He swung his powerful weapon and the enemy managed to sit down at the right moment. The man with the spear shouted that this idiot had dug his own grave and this time he would finish him off. But it was a trap. Someone stuck a sword into the rope and cut it. So the guy with the spear was simply knocked down by a huge tree. Kiri did it. She waited for the right moment and cut the rope at the right time. This distracted the red-haired man and Debo screamed. Does he still have time to look around? Debo again dealt him a crushing blow, but he managed to dodge and already tried to counterattack. Debo dodged the man's blade with lightning speed, and he was very surprised by this turn of events. Debo noticed that this was an advantageous position for a counterattack, and he dealt his opponent a crushing blow directly to the liver. 
Then he threw his weapon aside and just started fist fighting with him. He beat him in every possible way, not allowing his opponent to breathe. Debo knew how to fight, so this was just fun for him. But while he was beating that man, a girl with a crossbow aimed at him. And then suddenly she felt that there was someone behind her, and she quickly began to turn around. When she looked around, she noticed that Kiri's sword was flying straight at her head, and she managed to react. She began to quickly turn away to avoid being hit by these powerful attacks. All she had was her crossbow, with which she usually shot back at a long distance. Kiri attacked nonstop, and that girl with the crossbow tried to defend herself by blocking with her crossbow. Kiri shouted in a menacing voice to let this garbage focus on the battle. She doesn't like this situation so much. While this battle was taking place there, our hero went in search of that magician, and after some time he managed to track him down. The cross-eyed magician was talking to himself and thinking that it looked like everyone had already started. He's just wondering if Elpham wasn't expecting him by any chance. Elpham held his staff in his hand. He was calm and focused at that moment. The magician laughed and said that no matter how it was necessary to get down to business, their staffs burst into flames. And finally the magician fired a fiery arrow in the direction of our hero. Elpham also did the same. He used a fire arrow as if with a calm face. Friends, if you want me to quickly make the second part of the mamma you like, or you just want to support me, then you can use the super thank you function. I will be glad for any amount, since I spend several weeks creating one mamma recap, and sometimes even that doesn't pay off. And thank you to those who watch my videos to the end, you are invaluable. Alpam managed to react and quickly dodged the enemy's arrow, but after releasing his fiery arrow, he immediately used the ring to control it. The distraught magician said that this was excellent. He was shocked by what was happening here. The arrow rushed straight at the enemy, and it seemed to have reached its target. Elpham understood that everything would not be so simple. He just waited until the dust and smoke cleared away. For a moment it even seemed that there was no one there, and that the magician had died. But suddenly, out of that smoke, a whole bunch of some kind of energy rushed out, which was aimed directly at our hero's head. He took a closer look and right in flight noticed that it was something similar to a stone. When he managed to dodge the attack, he felt that there was someone behind him. It was the same magician who asked, Is this all he can do? And right behind him, he decided to use a fire arrow to wound him. A moment later, everything around was already on fire. But as we understand, our hero survived this attack. The enemy was approaching our hero through strong flames. Elpham stood and looked at his opponent holding a flaming staff in his hands. The magician asked in surprise, had he really just nullified this attack? He laughed and said that he definitely didn't expect this, and said that our hero definitely didn't have the strength to block it. But how did he pull it off? He was wondering what Elpham did now. How did it happen? Elpham did not answer his opponent. He simply remained silent. Then the enemy said that it seemed that he was not very talkative, but that did not matter. He said that they could not continue to chatter, he would figure it out himself, and released his arrow. Elpham also shot his arrow, and used a trick called a revolver. William was very surprised when he saw what happened for the power. Had he already spun the fire arrow using telekinesis, it completely crushed his spell. He had never even heard of this before, where did he learn it? All these thoughts flashed through his head in the blink of an eye. Then an explosion sounded. William said it was amazing. He saw how his opponent enhanced his ability with telekinesis. And now he realized that his opponent turns out to be a real genius. William smiled devilishly again and said that he just wouldn't see geniuses more than anyone else. He used the fire arrow again and said that he wanted to enjoy this moment a little more. He wanted to see how Elpham would pull off this trick again. But Elpham did it differently. He collected stones that were lying nearby and made a shield out of them using telekinesis. Then the arrow hit these stones, they were crushed, and Elpham jumped to the side. Mad William laughed and said what is he doing, is he hiding his best skill? Elpham managed to release a fiery arrow and then used telekinesis to control it. Elpham was silent and did everything concentrated, he aimed at the magician to kill him. William dodged these attacks in every possible way, he jumped and dodged. He then got angry and said that now the games are over. He used his fire arrow. Elpham understood that he would not have time to dodge such an attack and used a revolver. Thus, he managed to stop that arrow, and an explosion occurred again. The madman laughed and said that he had finally shown it again. He quickly moved behind our hero and at the same time he had a green ring. 
he asked if his opponent used both spells, then he used poisonous breath, and now we understand what power this ring has, and this force was truly terrifying. Everything around began to be shrouded in caustic poison. When this poison began to dissipate, William already hoped that his enemy had suffered. William said that the poisonous breath is of course powerful, but while he uses it, he remains completely defenseless. He asked our hero if his elements are this telekinesis and fire. If he can determine how long the recharge of the fire arrow lasts, he will stop his advance. Elpham froze in place. His opponent said that now he would not be able to move for thirty minutes. The arrow is also reloading, so let him forgive him for being rude, but he will have to finish him off with a blade. William approached our hero and said that now they had moved on to his favorite part, and his hands were itching. This man-man began to lick the blade and said that what despair would appear on his face. He laughed and said why isn't he trembling and crying, but suddenly he was surprised by what happened. Elpham quickly jumped up the mountain and attacked his opponent, who suspected nothing, and finally he hit him with all his might in the face with his fist. It was a truly crushing blow. This green-eyed magician's eyes almost popped out of his head, and then he flew several meters back. This time he did not know how to react. Now let's go back to the conversation in the bar where the man with the red headband who was a pirate asked how Debo did it. He was also very interested in how Elpham dealt with the poison of the crazy mushroom. His boss is not here, so he can tell everything. That man also said that he will pay for his drinking. Debo laughed and said what's the point if he hears this, he won't be able to repeat it anyway. And then he began to tell that he called it something like space. This is a spell that sucks in and locks the air with the help of telekinesis. When Debo already thought that he would die from the poison of the damn mushroom, then Elpham sucked a whole cloud of poisonous air into that space. But there's nothing special about this. Then the pirate said that it's not fair. Debo asked what he's talking about. He also said that his boss was too strong. And now let's return to our hero who beat that man-man. He had already knocked out several of his teeth. William tried to say something about poison, but Elpham did not let him breathe. He dealt him blow after blow, not sparing this man. He understood what he had done. And then he dealt him a series of crushing blows to different parts of the body. And then he dealt him another crushing blow to finish him off and he flew away hitting the tree. Then our hero pulled his staff towards him and grabbed it in his hand. He then used a fire arrow and aimed at his opponent who had just hit a tree. An ordinary person would have died long ago from such powerful blows, but this magician was still alive. Elbum made the last shot and almost crushed his opponent with such force that he even cut down the tree near which William was located. But still, William managed to dodge but Elpham shot off his hand. William screamed loudly and began to use his ring to still kill the enemy. He again tried to poison him with that poison. Well, I didn't know that our hero had an ace up his sleeve. Elpham used the same technique called space and again began to absorb that poison into this space. Elpham saw that this magician was using his tricks, acting as if he had gone crazy, but in fact he was targeting him. And his poison breath doesn't work because he's probably trying to get his staff back. Elpham thought that just let him try to do this and then he will finish him off. But suddenly something happened that our hero did not expect. It was a real fiery explosion. The fire burned very brightly and forces fell on our hero. The cross-eyed magician shouted that he would destroy this damn bastard and tear him apart. And to our surprise, Elpham actually took damage from that bastard. He even started coughing up blood and realized that he had lost his vigilance and that's what it cost him. He didn't expect that his opponent had a hidden fireball as a trump card. Before the regression, he would not have made such a mistake. His fireball again flew straight at our hero. He was too relaxed. While Debo was beating that red-haired man, he noticed this huge explosion. The red-haired man was already missing several teeth. Debo began to worry about his boss. The blonde girl cut off the head of another of her opponents. She said that there was no need to play with him. Just let him finish him off. Elpham's opponent is very strong. He can't handle it alone. Debo said that he didn't intend to do it that way, and don't let her order him. But suddenly someone killed the man he had just beaten. Someone shot an arrow at him and hit him in the eye. These were orcs and goblins who had crossbows and other weapons. Debo said that he had already forgotten about them. They had not been seen for too long. The girl said that these were the green goblins. They would quickly finish with them. Debo said that you should not underestimate them. Dealing with them is not so easy. Besides, they have someone very strange, 
they carried their leader on his wooden throne. William looked closely to see if our hero was dead or not yet. He tried to peer through the flames. But suddenly he felt that he had a hemorrhage inside and blood began to pour out of his mouth. And then he just started vomiting blood. This was accompanied by insane pain. And then he raised his head and smiled, said that he recognized that his opponent was not a weakling. I did not think that he would bring him to such a state. And then he said maybe you should have asked his name before killing him? The voice of our hero who told him that his name was Elpham. William thought that this was impossible. Elpham came out of that flame and told his enemy to remember this well. This is the name that he hears. William laughed and said that this damn cockroach won't die. He's trying to bluff that he's no match for William. Elpham held the cannonball in his hand and said that his opponent had only two circles and therefore he could not catch up with him. The magician saw that it was a mana stone. He was incredibly surprised when he saw it. And then he laughed loudly and said that his opponent was madness. Would he really put his hopes on this? He wants to absorb the mana stone and get another circle? He laughed loudly and called our hero a brainless bastard, and said that he wouldn't succeed, because he needed enlightenment after going through a lot of training. Elpham said in a calm voice that everything was correct, and then he applied the experience of the enlightenment, and everything worked out for him. William fell silent and looked angrily at what was happening now. The third circle appeared on our hero's hand, which means that he became even stronger. Elpham said that he already had enough of both. This moment was especially epic. William shouted that Elpham was trying to scare him again, but he would not succeed. He again used his staff and shot our hero. Elpham saw that two fiery arrows were approaching him, but without thinking for a long time, he used his fire arrow and released it. Thus, he immediately crushed two arrows of an enemy who was weaker than him. William was not going to give up and he used a fireball and threw it to our hero. Elpham used his levitation ring and used his revolver skill. Thus he crushed that fireball and aimed his arrow directly at the enemy's head. And already approaching William, the arrow began to act and William's blood simply began to boil. This was the last shot. It hit the target and finally crushed the enemy. Elpham was covered in dirt and dust. Black soot covered his exhausted face. In the place where this mighty surge of energy occurred, only a few burnt bones of William remained. Elpham only now realized that he forgot to ask what his name was. Now let's get back to Debo and Kiri. They had to fight the goblins. Well, something went wrong. They hid behind a tree and Debo was obviously not okay. It was obviously very difficult for him. And Kiri supported him and thought that everything had not gone according to plan. But in order to understand what happened, you need to look at what happened before. Debo eliminated his opponents one by one and counted them. 16. 17. Meanwhile, Kiri, fighting with one monster, did not understand how Debo could defeat these monsters so easily. Elpham shouted that it was as easy as shelling pears. He saw right through their fighting style. Debo was very quick to dodge and attack his opponents from behind. And finally, he was about to crush 18 monsters in a row. Well, suddenly there was some kind of surge of energy, and Debo just fell to the ground. Then an explosion occurred right at the place where our hero's assistant fell. The orc was saved. As it turned out, Debo was knocked down by the same supreme orc who was on the throne. He used a fireball. Kiri didn't understand how this monster could use this spell. For her it was something completely new. A monster that was able to control objects. They couldn't even think about that. Things didn't go as they planned. They can only hide and wait for Elpham to return. She hoped that he was still alive. And then the Ord discovered them and tried to grab them. But the girl managed to react and jumped away, saving Debo. She quickly tried to run away. It was hard for her to drag the wounded Debo over herself. But she was not going to leave him. Meanwhile the orcs were trying to catch these guys. Suddenly, an orc jumped out right in front of the girl and swung his axe to kill her. Kiri quickly threw Debo into the air with all her strength and quickly cut off her opponent's head. Then she quickly grabbed Debo before he fell to the ground and said that she was such a pain in the ass. She could deal with them if they attacked alone. Suddenly... A fireball fell right in her path, blocking her path further. This was done by the same orc magician who was also changing. The girl thought that if this monster had not existed, it would have been easier. And he again used his fireball to crush the girl and Debo. She tried her best to evade and tried to run as quickly as possible to avoid the attack. An explosion occurred. The demonic creature was already smiling, thinking that this was the end. Well, when you started to disperse... He noticed that Debo was standing there, who had not died. 
Kiri was very surprised when she noticed that Debo was standing. He had just been unconscious. There was nothing on his face, just a cold look into nowhere. He rushed at his opponent incredibly quickly. He was very serious. The chief orc shouted in his own language and all his other subjects rushed forward. Debo ran straight towards them and began to chop these creatures into pieces. It was as if he had recharged while he was out. He seemed to become even faster. The orc leader once again used his fireball power to destroy the enemy. Debo dodged that attack with lightning speed. Kiri did not understand how this could ever happen. Debo made an incredibly high jump and rushed straight onto the head of the main boss. Kiri thought that he only has one circle. How can he be so strong? When the orc noticed that he was about to be destroyed, he immediately at that moment used the power of fire and attacked Debo. From such a crushing blow, Debo could not keep his balance. His clothes simply tore and he began to fall. Kiri ran up to him to understand him. Because the orc cast this spell very close to his face, he was wounded. His jaw was half open. He felt a very strong pain inside him. His face was disfigured. He again used the power of the fireball to crush his opponent. Debo was in a lot of pain, but he told Kiri, who was standing right in front of him, to step aside and he would take over. The orc attacked again, and it seemed that Debo would no longer survive such an attack. But it was our hero who came to help and used his fiery arrow. The orc did not expect such a turn of events. Now the last thing he saw was the revolver skill. Alpum simply crushed that orc leader on his own throne, tearing him into pieces. Exhausted Kiri looked in surprise. What just happened? Alpum was very exhausted. It was not easy for him to stand. Then he said that it looked like he was not late. Meanwhile, on the other side of the portal, the same red-haired man was sitting and yawning loudly. Four days have passed since then, and there is no sign of anyone. At first he was glad that he could make money so easily, but now it was starting to get boring. Still, he doesn't really like it. He won't take on protection missions anymore. Suddenly he heard some noise. The portal began to collapse. Well, it just began to crack and fall. The red-haired man was shocked by what happened. Did the portal collapse? This man's assistant turned to the boss and told him to call the bishop here. This man's name was Kite. By the way the man wise called the last adventurer. The red-haired man asked him what was happening and let him report the situation. Kite said that some returned alive. The gate began to disappear. And finally, that man saw the half-dead Dibwa. Alpum and Kiri just fall out at the gate. They were all unconscious. And finally, after some time, Alpum opened his eyes. Looking around... He noticed that he was lying on the bed. He quickly got up. A red-haired man was sitting in front of him and said that he had finally come to his senses. Elpum asked where he was. The red-haired man told Elpum to answer him honestly now. Of all the gaper merchants who entered there, only three of them survived. He was interested in what happened at those gates. Elpum asked are there really only the three of them left? A healer approached him and began to use her power to heal our hero. Elpum said that he thought that everyone else was dead. But that red-haired man told Elpum to answer him normally if he didn't want to follow them. Elpum said that there was a demon there. Well, he asked for a pen made of paper so that he could try to draw it. Elpum tried to explain to him. He said that he did not know what it was called. And after a while, that man shouted that there was no point in this at all. Then they gathered near the tent to talk about what happened. A whole hundred people. Moreover, they all represented merchant guilds. Was it a simple red gate? They discussed whether they all really died because of the monsters. But after all, fighting them they even shouldn't have sweated. The representative of the Heavenly Trade and the Toriel Guild said that his cousin was there. The red-haired man showed the drawing to Elpum and said that it didn't look like Elpum was dead. According to him, this is what the boss looked like at the gate in which hundreds of people entered. It was the Green Goblin. Such monsters seemed to be able to use tools. One of them said that he heard that they are so intelligent that in large numbers they can become equivalent to a human army. Only one hundred people were against this. They probably didn't just have to. There was a man with a long mustache who said that this was unacceptable. He doesn't know what happened to the others. But Natasha would never have died from something like this. It was a representative of the Goldrich Trade Guild named Franco. The red-haired man who gathered them all here said what he was talking about. Then Franco said is he really asking because he doesn't know about it. Then he said that it was trolling. None of this makes sense unless someone set them up. Can't they really figure out what happened at the gate? Can someone really easily take advantage of this, intentionally or not, and all three survivors were from the same group? 
The man with a cigar in his mouth said that he couldn't listen to this nonsense anymore. Is he really trying to say that Gaper betrayed everyone? Isn't the point here that their guys turned out to be stronger or more cunning because they survived? Then a man with a long mustache said that his interlocutor really wants to say that their traitors are worse than the Gaper traitors. Then this man with a cigar said that he does not want to say this. He is simply stating a fact. But his interlocutor said that if Gaper had so many talents, they would not have been pushed into the very back. The man with a cigar said that they were just beginners, figuring out the career ladder. So let them make room. The red-haired man listened to these nonsense and said that they should stop talking about it already. Franco said that for such bold words there must surely be evidence, right? Then the man with the cigar said that they didn't take any perverted items, they simply didn't have a motive. Doesn't he understand? Elpham and his assistants said that he would go and thank them for their help. Then the red-haired man said that he should be more careful there. He looked after him and Lanco turned to him, and then asked if they could just leave. The man with red hair said that haven't they already come to a conclusion? Our heroes walked through the forest. There was a light wind blowing that was able to break through the trees. Suddenly Elpham noticed that a snail appeared on his way. It was somehow unusual. Kiri also noticed this snail and said that he really followed them. This snail looked quite harmless. There was a flower on its shell. Now let's move back to the time where the battle took place. Kiri turned to someone and asked why he was in the bag. They had already dealt with the followers of the Dark Mage, as well as the Green Goblin and his minions. Now they just had to throw out all the items and hurt each other a little, right? Elpham looked at his interlocutor. Meanwhile, in his bag were the feathers of that magician. This is exactly what they need to do. Kill the boss and get rid of these items. But the item that that mage had was the first phoenix. Just by keeping it with you, you can increase the damage of fire magic by 30%. Unlike many other items, it can accumulate effects. Elpham thought that now he understands the reason why the adventurers were killed in heaps here. Unexpected prey. You need to take him with you no matter what. Kiri said that if they bring out something that is not registered in advance, they will become suspected of trolling. Didn't he remind everyone about this too? She told him that he should not be greedy and act according to the plan, since they had already found a way out. But then they noticed this very snail which helped them with those items. It was a pet snail. It has no attack power, and also loves to sniff around and collect all sorts of junk. The more items he collects, the larger his shell becomes. This is the creature that Elpham found in the gate in a past life. Thus, this creature helped our hero carry valuable items with him. The pet snail gave our hero those two phoenix feathers. Kiri said that he was able to carry it out unnoticed. How did he know about this snail? Elpham told her that he decided to just try. Kiri asked what Jinya should do now. She did as he said. But what is Elpham going to do next? Elpham answered her that she should not rush. Since they are even in the ranks of the Cygnus Knights, they should be more careful. If they are not careful, they will hide even deeper. And then our hero looked to the side and said that they should have returned already. They need to wait. Genis, Merdia, Goldrich, Elnido, and Nebusnea. They were all destroyed. It was a failed raid. This was talked about by a woman with black hair who came to her boss again. She said that it was said here that they were all killed by the boss monster during the raid, and only three made it out of Gaper barely alive. At the meeting they were suspected of trolling, that is, they did not know who was actually involved in this. And even this idea was eventually abandoned due to the lack of witnesses. Fortunately, due to the failure of the raid, they were not exposed, and she will prepare for the next mission. It was raining heavily outside and there was lightning. That man with white hair stood at the window as always. He did not smile and asked his interlocutor if they had been caught. She replied that their plan was to destroy all the units and he personally killed the boss, which means at least one of the three survivors saw William. But this was not in the reports from Elpham. But why would he hide it? Even if he did it then they have people in many guilds. It would be difficult for them to figure them out. What if he realized that behind this was just a merchant guild and they, the followers of that person, then they would be the only ones who would know about the return of the master's followers. What if he decides to spread this information? When the girl with black hair said that this cannot be, in which case they are in danger, they must immediately cut off ties with all the merchants from others before things get out of control. Then we are talking about some kind of invitation. The man with white hair laughed and said that it was interesting and he accepted it. He also said that, however, it would be better to choose another scene, so that 101 spectators would gather there, 
and at the same time new gates would appear. Thank you for watching this video. If you like this manhwa and would like to see its continuation then be sure to write about it in the comments. If I see good activity in the form of comments and likes, and we also get half a million views on this video, then I will definitely do its second part. Also don't forget to subscribe to my channel and click on the bell so you don't miss new videos. And watch other similar videos on this channel. See you later.